Hello and welcome back, everybody. This is James Lindsay. You're listening to the New Discourses podcast, and we are finally, I guess, continuing our exploration of Herbert Marcuse's 1969 essay on liberation. To kind of catch you up to speed, this will be the third part out of four in this series, as it is a very long essay broken into four parts. The first of those parts we read some time ago, went through what he called a biological foundation for socialism. To kind of just throw that out there and stare at it for a second is already horrifying, but a biological foundation for socialism. Now he clarifies that he doesn't mean biology, biology. He doesn't mean like real biology, biology. Although, do you trust these people with their double meanings of words? Of course, we don't trust these people with their double meanings of words. But what he describes as biological might more accurately... It's not quite psychological because he distinguishes from it, but it's probably best to think of it as a psychological level. What he's trying to say is that he wants to create a new kind of man that is changed in terms of how he perceives the world so that he can't function in the world as it is because he sees how intolerable the oppression, the systems of power, the exploitation, etc. are, the alienation is. And he's going to overthrow these because he's going to want a uh, new liberated world. He wants to achieve liberation. And to get there, we need to have at the biological level, meaning the level of his needs. He doesn't literally mean, he says he doesn't literally mean the biological level, but at the level of his very needs, he's going to need liberation from the oppressive system. He's not going to be able to function in the existing society. Now, we see this same kind of thing echoed in Paulo Freire's uh, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which was written at roughly the same time, where he's describing the, the dependency of the peasant. And then he points out that rather than taking the, the peasant who's awakening to the state of his dependency in this crooked Brazilian system, that's Paulo Freire's context, rather than showing him, oh, here's your dependency, and here are pathways by which you can start to take responsibility within the confines of the system to grow yourself, to gain power, and eventually start to change the system through liberal and democratic means. Instead, no, you're supposed to awaken a revolutionary consciousness that's going to smash the entire system. And you can say what you want about Brazil in the 1960s. I don't know, for example, myself very much about the political context, but we have these same mentalities being applied to the United States and Western Europe in the 1990s, going forward through the woke ideology. So he's talking about creating a biological need to effectively, effectively, and I've switched back to Marcuse for my he here, effectively to induce psychopathology. I'm not trying to throw stigma, blah, 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 about psychopathology, but the definition of a psychopathology is to have a mental and emotional state such that it impacts your day-to-day ability to exist. It has net material impacts on your ability to live a normal and fulfilling life. And what Marcuse is advocating for, as Freire was doing it almost exactly the same time in a, on another continent, is creating conditions such that people enter into a state where they find the ability to live in the existing system intolerable to the, the very level of their needs, that they feel like they can no longer function in this system and that they're going to therefore want to refuse, he calls it a great refusal of the existing system and advocate for a liberating revolution that's going to overthrow that system. And it's again at the biological level of needs. And so what he's saying, and I think he and Freire here make the case unambiguously, and I've said this a few times, is that he's saying that The point of critical theory, because that's what he names as the tool for doing this, the point of a critical theory, the point of praxis, if you want to put it in Ferrari's Marxian words, is to induce this psychological pathology that makes you incapable of living in the world as it is, and then to groom people who are therefore made vulnerable into becoming revolutionaries for their cause. So when I wrote The Cult Dynamics of Wokeness, a year ago, 
Over a year ago, this is one of the things I'm kind of talking about. I'm talking about the fact that the point of a critical theory is to groom the inability to interact in the world on a day-to-day -day basis. In other words, to groom psychopathology, to create vulnerability, and then to use the ideology, the revolutionary ideology, as a means by which you can resolve that vulnerability and tension. So that's the first part of this essay on liberation, is that we need a biological foundation for socialism, where biological is said to not mean biological, but you could see that it is in line with the Soviet New Man project, with Marx's Soviet man who's psychologically changed, but may later become physically and biologically changed into the Superman. Uh, you know, the Nietzschean idea of the Superman, for example, um, Although Marx wasn't taking it from Nietzsche, he was taking it from other places, obviously. So this is the first part of this essay on liberation. The second part of this essay on liberation is called The New Sensibility, and I found this to be a very important and groundbreaking part of my research into the history of critical theory in terms of explaining where we are now. Marcuse's argument is that the problem is, why have the... Preview, why, first of all, two, two things he's, he finds intolerable. Why do liberal orders persist? And why, when there are revolutions, do they always turn oppressive and awful? And he holds up, you know, the Soviets as an example as a problem. He's praiseworthy of China, not knowing apparently that millions by tens of millions are being murdered by Mao uh, or starved by Mao or killed by Mao in his cultural revolution at the time he's praising them. But he says that the reason is because the old sensibility, what we consider sensible and insensible in the world, the old sensibility of good and bad, the old morality, etc., are all, the old Overton window, are all being carried forward. And he says, of course, like Ferrari also in Brazil, that this is a pattern of domination. And so the new revolutionaries gain power and immediately reproduce the conditions of oppression because that's all they know. Ferrari makes exactly the same argument. They reproduce oppression. It doesn't fail because it doesn't work. It fails because there's no new sensibility that causes people to enter into a new way of thinking about everything from their new biological need for socialism. They carry forth the old ideas. Remember Mao's idea was to destroy the four olds, the old culture, the old values, the old ways of being, the old ideas, um, whatever the four olds. I think that's what the four olds are. Old customs, old habits, old uh, ideas, and old something. Um, destroy the four old. Why? Because you have to have a new sensibility to go forward. You have to have all of those old sensibilities has to be destroyed. And he says up to this point, Marcuse says up to this point, when he's writing this in 1969, none of the revolutions have achieved this new sensibility that gives rise to a new rationality. The new rationality gives rise to a new, I guess you could say, world order in which it will work this time. So he's saying the reason that liberalism persists is the same reason that uh, free societies persist is the same reason that um, communism or communist revolutions or socialist revolutions in the past have all failed. And it's that the oppressor-oppressed dynamic, the dialectic between the oppressor and the oppressed, the master-slave dialectic of Hegel, in a sense, continues. And so the newly empowered dictatorship of the proletariat just becomes an oppressive force because they didn't adopt a new sensibility. Of course, when they attempted this idea in the French Revolution, it was a complete failure. When they repeated it and attempted it in the Cambodian Revolution under the Khmer Rouge, it was a utter catastrophe. The killing fields are still a place that you can go. You can see the bones. You can see the skulls. You can see the horrors. They were killing people left, right, and center because they wanted to get back to year zero reset the whole world, have a giant great reset of the world, get to year zero where everything's new, there's a new sensibility. And it struck me when I was reading through, or just after I read through for the podcast, as a matter of fact, new sensibility, that Kimberly Crenshaw referred to intersectionality as a sensibility all the way back in Mapping the Margins. She didn't, doesn't see intersectionality as a theory, she thinks of it as a sensibility. And I was like, oh my gosh. And then she, she says this many other times in many other places, it's a sensibility a new sensibility in the world, where we're now going to think in terms of positional power dynamics constantly. Who are you matters for what you say or do matters more than your character. 
she explicitly says, I am black means more than I am a person who happens to be black because I'm a person who happens to be black, strives for a certain universality. She says it's impossible to achieve because identity is imposed by power structures. So we must live in the power structures. This is a new sensibility. Turns out to be a neo-Marxist sensibility. She says we shouldn't be striving for a certain universality because that wouldn't be productive of identity politics. And the identity politics is exactly what we're going to now talk about, in a sense, when we read section three of an essay on liberation from Herbert Marcuse in 1969, which is titled Subverting Forces in Transition. Subverting Forces in Transition. So off we go reading through. I personally, I reread this yesterday to make sure I knew what I was looking at. I find, and it's, I'm probably, I'm possibly missing something anyway, I find the first half or so of this section to be a bit dull. It is the identity politics thing. I don't think there's a lot of overwhelming depth, like, oh my gosh, new sensibility, wow, biological foundation for socialism, wow, um, in the first half of this. But then it gets pretty crazy. Uh, and for the good news is, when we get to part four, which is about solidarity, in the next installment of this series, um, that one's quite short as compared to the other three parts of this essay. So we're a little bit past halfway through this essay so far at the beginning of part three. So what does he write? If you remember in part two, he talked a lot about aesthetics, he talked a lot about the aesthetic form necessary for the revolution. He talked a lot about art and anti-art and so on. And here we're going to start off kind of with that feel again. He says the notion of aesthetic form as the capital F form of a free society would indeed mean reversing the development of socialism from scientific to utopian, unless we can point to certain tendencies in the infrastructure of advanced industrial society, which may give this notion a realistic content. So that's the opening sentence of this. This is actually a heavy duty sentence. I just said that the first part's boring. This is a heavy duty sentence. Okay. Heavy duty reversing the development of socialism from scientific to utopian. So what he's saying is, Marx is the one who said that socialism was scientific, scientific socialism, Wissenschaftlicher, uh, Licker, uh, Sozialism, Sozialism, or something of this in German, scientific socialism. He believed that his study of dialectical materialism was the true science of history, the true science of material conditions, that it is scientific socialism, and therefore it's, it produces predictable outcomes, etc. And he says that we want to um, reverse from that, from scientific socialism to utopian socialism, utopian being nowhere. Now, around the same time, you have his buddy in the Frankfurt School, Theodore Adorno, writing things like, it's not possible to cast a positive image of the utopia. You have them coalescing in the Frankfurt School and the neo-Marxist thought that, it, that there is no positive vision of utopia. Utopia is what emerges from the ashes when you burn down the problematics of society. I phrase that in other episodes as when you peel back all the negative uh, negatives, the problematics of society, you peel all that away. The seed of the perfect society can emerge, whether it's like seeds of gold from alchemy growing into the, changing the base metal into to, to gold whether that's um, the phoenix rising from the ashes of a society burned down. It's not possible to say what the utopia looks like. This is communism doesn't know how. It's not possible. It is, in fact, a negative concept. They explicitly say that. They, they write on this at length. Adorno does for sure. That, that utopia is intrinsically a negative concept. And this is where you have Marcuse advocating, um, I think it's in this essay, but it might have been in Repressive Tolerance, where he says that negative thinking becomes positive. Negative thinking is tearing down the problematics, constantly taking, and it's a very Hegelian concept, you take what you see and you hit it with its negative, negative thinking, negative dialectic. You have a negative dialectic. That's the 19, title of the 1966 book by Adorno. It's not quite the context of what a negative dialectic is, but negative thinking is the process, the critical philosophy that uh that you know, Marx took from Hegel and from picking up off of Kant and the other critics. Nietzsche was another critic, by the way, especially of morality. You this, this negative philosophy, ruthless criticism of everything that exists for for Marx. So he says we're going to back off from the scientific approach and go back to the more utopian view. That we don't know. We're this is his his speaking in 1969 toward a negative dialectic, which I think is very similar to, if not 
identical to the deconstruction of postmodernism uh, in a slightly different context. So you're seeing kind of postmodern themes developing here. So we're going to back off from Marx and move back toward Hegel is in a sense what's being said here. We're going to back away from scientific socialism and move more toward utopian unless we can point, he says, to certain tendencies in the infrastructure of advanced industrial society, which may give this notion a realistic content. And he's going to talk about that, about the technology, about the different groups in society for identity politics and so on. And he says, and we have repeatedly referred to such tendencies. First of all, the growing technological character of the process of production with the reduction of the required physical energy and its replacement by mental energy. In other words, he says the dematerialization of labor. Okay, so this is, he says, maybe, maybe, maybe we can continue with a scientific socialism if we're thinking about how technology is creating new avenues to reduce the exploitation of the laboring class. And he's starting to, and this is very important to indicate here in 1969, the reduction of required physical energy and its replacement by mental energy to the creation of the so-called creative class. You will notice that the woke are all very bourgey. Why are they so bourgeois? They are theoreticians. They are a creative class. They are expending mental energy. Everything's about media and culture and the culture industry and everything is like, no, who's producing anything? Do you see these guys swinging a hammer? There was a joke, I think the Babylon Bee put out where they said, you know, that a, I don't know if it's Marxist or woke or leftist or what, shocked to find out that the hammer and sickle represent physical labor. So he says, well, technology is getting rid of that. And this is the characteristic of this so-called fourth industrial revolution with the freaking great reset behind it is now we're shifting away where we're, we're going to have all these machines and things that do everything for us. So all that's going to be left is creative energy, creative activity. He's predicting this here. And he says, oh, we can have a revolution or scientific revolution under those conditions. He says also, at the same time, an increasingly automated machine system no longer uses a system of exploitation would allow that distantiation of the laborer from the instruments of production, which Marx foresaw at the end of capitalism. The workers would cease to be the principal agents of material production and become its supervisors and regulators. The emergence of a free subject within the realm of necessity. Already today, the achievements of science and technology permit the play of the productive imagination. Experimentation with the possibilities of form and matter hitherto enclosed in the density of unmastered nature. The technical transformation of nature tends to make things lighter, easier, prettier, the loosening up of reification. The material becomes increasingly susceptible and subject to aesthetic forms, which enhance its exchange value, the artistic modernistic banks, office buildings, kitchens, salesrooms, and salespeople, etc. And within the framework of capitalism, the tremendous growth in the productivity of labor enforces the ever-enlarged production of luxuries. He has that in scare quotes. Wasteful in the armament industry and in the marketing of gadgets, devices, trimmings, and status symbols. So you can kind of see, he's saying that technology is now changing the world, He's predicting a transition toward a different working class, that the laborer is not going to be the site of raising revolutionary consciousness. The creative class will be. And how convenient for him as somebody who sees himself as kind of the kingpin of that intelligentsia. He says, the same trend of production and consumption which makes for the affluence and attraction of advanced capitalism makes for the perpetuation of of the struggle for existence, for the increasing necessity to produce and consume the non-necessary. Okay, so you, what's the buzzword of the day? Sustainability, right? So here's what he's saying is sustainability is going to be the site of a revolutionary force. The same trend of production and consumption, he says, which makes for the affluence and attraction of advanced capitalism, makes for the perpetuation of the struggle for existence. What does existence mean here then? You're comfortable, you can pursue your fancies, your fashions. I just saw that the first Indian track and field gold medalist in the Olympics here at Tokyo in 2021 threw the javelin some ridiculous distance, and he taught himself to throw a javelin while working at home using YouTube videos. The affluence and attraction of advanced capitalism makes for the perpetuation of the struggle for existence. What does he mean? 
by existence here. Comfortable, you can eat, you can pursue your freedoms. Does it mean that figuring out who you are? Does it mean creating a liberated society? And it says, for the increasing necessity to produce and consume the non-necessary. So people like Herbert Marcuse are going to be able to decide for us in this new planned economy focused on sustainability what is and is not necessary. The stakeholders involved will determine what is necessary and not necessary, so eat the bugs. Just eat the damn bugs. Steak isn't necessary. Meat isn't necessary. Travel isn't necessary. Get your vaccine. He says the so-called gr the growth of the so-called discretionary income in the United States indicates the extent to which income earned is spent on other than basic needs. That's bad. Having discretionary income, having a rising affluence in the middle class is bad. Of course it is for him because as we've re repeatedly remarked about Marcuse, the rising up of comfortability in a system, a liberal capitalist system that works, steals for them the revolutionary energy that they were trying to induce by so-called, as Lenin put it, accelerating the contradictions, making things as uncomfortable and miserable as possible so that people would be more aware of their alienation. These people are evil. Then he goes on to say, you know, money being able to be spent, he says, on things other than basic needs somehow is bad. He says, former luxuries become basic needs. Here's how he says that it's bad. Former luxuries become basic needs. So you get used to having good stuff, and then they become needs. You can't live without them. What used to be a luxury. Isn't that what people call progress, though? There is, of course, the danger that nobody knows how anything works, etc., that everybody gets in in spoiled and entitled. We look at the millennials. Sorry, millennials that are listening to this. This is your meme. Former luxuries become basic needs, he says, and he's, he, this is a problem for him. This is why discretionary income and building, strengthening middle class is bad. So the normal development, which under corporate capitalism extends the competitive business of living to newly created needs and satisfactions, the fantastic output of all sorts of things and services defies the imagination while restricting and distorting it in the commodity form through which capitalist production enlarges its hold over human existence. Yeah, you have discretionary income, so you can buy things that you enjoy and maybe that you don't actually need to live, and you're happy in your life, and all these fantastic things and services defies the imagination. But of course, it's just capitalism commodifying things, so it's really bad. And what it actually does is leads to capitalist production enlarging its hold over human existence. It's, his enemy is capitalism. It has to be destroyed. Discretionary income, rising economic status and comfort are the enemy to Herbert Marcuse. People having a better life in a system that works is the enemy for him. You can picture him wandering around Santa Monica, California, beautiful location, hating everything he sees, because that's basically the story of the guy at this point. He had left, you know, Germany or whatever because of the war. He had been, he left different East Coast universities and he lands in Southern California. And yet, he says, precisely through the spread of this commodity form, the repressive social morality which sustains the system is being weakened. The obvious contradiction between the liberating possibilities of the technological transformation of the world the light and the free life on the one hand, and the intensification of the struggle for existence on the other. Again, what does he mean by existence? Generates among the underlying population that diffused aggressiveness, which unless steered to hate and fight the alleged national enemy, hits upon any suitable target, white or black, native or foreigner, Jew or Christian, rich or poor. So he's talking about the rise of relative privation. This is what he's talking about here. And it says it's a new dialectical contradiction that's going to have to be resolved. People see the liberating possibilities. They see that these machines can do all this work. They see that they could have an easier life. And even though their material conditions, are, their, their conditions of life are improving, their quality of life is improving in terms of the material conditions, he says, no, they're experiencing a contradiction, a light and free life on the one hand, an intensification of the struggle for existence on the other. But again, we hit that word existence and we don't know what he means by it. The struggle for existence, he's talking about liberation. He says that there is no existence until we have liberation earlier in the essay. So what he actually means is, wow, we're seeing a better and better life, but we're still not becoming communist. 
And not everybody has the best stuff. And that, he says, generates in the underlying population that diffused aggressiveness. They lack meaning in their life. They're comfortable and enjoy their life, but not everybody is. And people become aggressive and they become, you know, mean with one another. They have this dissatisfaction he believes is there because probably he has dissatisfaction. And he says, unless that's steered to fight, hate and fight the alleged national enemy, he probably is going to have Vietnam in mind here, of course. Given that it was 1969, he mentions the Viet Cong later in this section. Hits upon any suitable target. So then he has white and black, native or foreigner, Jew or Christian, rich or poor. So he says that people are getting more and more socially angry at people. Remember, this is in 1969 after the agitations. We just had the civil rights movement, which was tumultuous, but generally good. We also had all these neo-Marxist agitations with their riots and their violence and the different things, the riots in Detroit. We had lots of different things that were going on and that there were social tensions. And so what does he blame it on? He blames it on the fact that people have more comfortable lives because of the success of capitalism, because it's obviously the thing to blame for everything. And he says it, in fact, this is the aggressiveness of those with the mutilated experience with the false consciousness and the false needs, the victims of repression who, for their living, depend on the repressive society and repress the alternative, which is communism. Their violence is that of the establishment and takes as its targets figures, which rightly or wrongly seem to be different and represent an alternative. But while the image, remember, by the way, every time he says the repressive society, he's talking about free liberal society with capitalist a capitalist market. That's what he's talking about as a repressive society. The victims of that repression are people who are having generally good lives and generally upward mobility and generally rising standards of living and generally declining problems like infant mortality, starvation, hunger, etc. Living paycheck to paycheck, etc. They depend on the repressive society, so they repress the alternative, which is socialism or liberation or communism. However, the path is supposed to work out there. So he says their violence is the violence of the establishment all over again. But while the image, he says, of the libertarian potential of advanced industrial society is repressed and hated by the managers of repression and their consumers, that's everyday people, by the way, that's business owners and their customers. The libertarian, that means liberated, socialist potential of advanced industrial society is repressed and hated by the managers of repression and their consumers because the whole system is built to grind in one direction, which is to keep everybody exploited because it's capitalism, because that's what the thing that he hates because he's a communist. He says, while that image is happening and is hated, it motivates the radical opposition, that's him, and gives it its strength I'm sorry, it gives it its strange and orthodox character. Very different from the revolution at previous stages of history, this opposition is directed against the totality of a well-functioning, prosperous society. A protest against its form, the commodity form of men and things, against the imposition of false values and a false morality. Did you get that? So he's comparing against the revolution. The revolution. There's only one revolution, the communist revolution at different stages of history, which are just testing themselves out and failing according to the dialectic, having to work out different contradictions that hasn't figured out. Very different from the revolution, he says, at at, at previous stages in history, this new opposition which rises up by the image of being able to picture the utopia through technology. He's saying you can picture the utopia through technology. You can see it. You can almost taste it. It's right there. It's right within your grasp. It's right there. But the manager's of repression in their consumers. In other words, the capitalists are keeping, they hate that image. They don't want people to be truly free. They don't want liberation. And that motivates the opposition. That's him. And motivates the radicals, the neo-Marxists. And it gives him a strange, unorthodox character. He says, and it's very different from previous stages of history, the revolution and stages of history. Now it's directed not against something, this or that, against the totality of a well-functioning, prosperous society. A protest against its form. The idea of a well-functioning and prosperous society is Marcuse's enemy because he says it prevents liberation. In other words, it maintains capitalist society and prevents socialist society, which he describes a capitalist society as the commodity form of men and things with false values and a false morality. This is what he's about. This new consciousness, he says, and the instinctual rebellion 
isolate such opposition from the masses. Remember, they're, they're rebelling against the fact that they can taste utopia. The machines are going to give us utopia. The industrial society is there. We can manage it. It will work this time. And so they have an instinctual rebellion against the fact that everything's not already perfect. This is very Gnostic, by the way. Very Gnostic. We've been flung, as Heidegger puts it, flung into this system that's imperfect. And if we would just take hold and manage it, we don't have to do anything but change ourselves and change the world. And then we're no longer flung out into this world that is a system in the world that is imperfect, but rather we have taken hold of it and made it perfectible. And he says this new consciousness and the instinctual rebellion isolate such opposition from the masses, there's your working class, and the majority of organized labor, the integrated majority, and make for the concentration of radical politics and active minorities, mainly among the young middle class intelligentsia and among the ghetto populations. Here, prior to all political strategy and organization, liberation becomes a vital biological need. So he says, we're going to take young, well-off kids who are overeducated, the young middle-class intelligentsia, and we're going to agitate also, we're looking at, he's looking at black power movement, black nationalism, etc. He's looking at, you know, the militancy that's rising up in certain corners of, you know, the, the, the gay community at this point. We're going to, there, there, liberation is a vital biological need. So now we're going to create this unholy fusion between students who are educated into a critical theory consciousness and disaffected populations who are angry and pissed off at the unfairness of their lives. And we're going to create a new dimension of theory. It is, of course, nonsense, he says to say that middle-class opposition is replacing the proletariat as a revolutionary class. Except it's not. That's what you just said. It's not nonsense. You're saying that we're going to move the revolutionary energy out of the working class. We're not going to pay attention to the proletariat any longer. We're now going to shift our attention to uppity entitled kids and getting them in alliance with angry disaffected minorities. That's literally what you just said. And he says, but it's nonsense to say that the middle class opposition is replacing the proletariat as a revolutionary class, and that the lumpen proletariat is becoming a radical political force. Oh, that there's your nonsense. The lumpen proletariat are basically your small business owners who, according to classic Marxian theory, um, are oppressed but are completely unable to realize it because they think that they've got theirs with their small businesses. Um, they're very similar to the the, the kulaks that uh, that. Lenin liquidated um, viciously. What is happening, Marcuse says, is the formation of still relatively small and weakly organized, often disorganized, groups, which by virtue of their consciousness and their needs function as potential catalysts of rebellion within the majorities to which by their class origin they belong. So now he's talking about kind of an internal infectious structure, small, weakly organized groups they have their awakened consciousness, and they're catalysts of rebellion within the majorities. In this sense, the militant intelligentsia has indeed cut itself loose from the middle classes and the ghetto population from the organized working class. But by that token, they do not think and act in a vacuum. Their consciousness and their goals make them representatives of the very real common interest of the oppressed. And against the rule of class and national interests which suppress this common interest, the revolt against the old societies is truly international. The emergence of a new spontaneous solidarity. This struggle is a far cry from the ideal humanism and humanitas. It is a struggle, or it is the struggle for life. Life not as masters and not as slaves, but as men and women. Recalls a poster that I've seen painted on buildings in Beijing men, women, what does it say, man, woman, boy, girl, we are all the same. Uh, this communism. We're not going to have struggles of masters and slaves, people who are unequal, but rather we're just going to be men and women. No, of course we see his uh, transphobia here, but that's a, 
It's an aside. He would be forgiven this. It's a man of his times because he's a leftist. So for Marxian theory, he writes, the location or rather contraction of the opposition in certain middle class strata and in the ghetto population appears to be an intolerable deviation. So he's saying the Marxists, classical Marxists, the vulgar Marxists, don't like what's happening here. And what's happening is that the working class is being decentered from Marxian theory and is being these being shifted to these entitled intelligentsia, these entitled students who are being brought up into the critical theory and into racial minority groups that are being agitated with neo-Marxism. Rather than workers of the world unite, you now have races of the world divide, as the uh, World Socialist website very cleanly put it with regard to why they dislike critical race theory. You're now going to have this high-minded theory servicing angry identity politics populations, and they're going to form solidarity. He says a very natural solidarity, and Marxists, he says, correctly says, don't like it because it's stealing away from working class solidarity that they believe is the true thing that shouldn't be racial, racial, it shouldn't have sex, it shouldn't have um, uh, gender differences or sexuality differences. Everybody who hates the, the, the bourgeoisie, uh, hates the capitalist system is on the same footing and that solidarity is necessary to create the dictatorship or the proletariat that will usher us to communist utopia. So they find this intolerable, he says. Marxists find this intolerable, which is true. He says, also, as does the emphasis on biological and aesthetic needs, regression to bourgeois or even worse, aristocratic ideology. So the Marxists are criticizing him, saying, oh, you're focusing on this nonsense, high, you know, highfalutin biological changes and aesthetic needs. They're accusing them of bourgeois and aristocratic behavior, entitled lower upper class in behavior. And that's exactly what they're actually doing. The Marxists are calling them out. And he's like, well, they don't like that. And he then it explains, but in the advanced monopoly capitalist countries, the displacement of this of the opposition from the organized industrial working classes to militant minorities is caused by the internal development of the society. In other words, all that upward mobility, all that rising in the conditions of life, all of those civil rights in 1969 that had just started to be awarded, those are going to steal away revolutionary potential. That All those contradictions that made life intolerable, that showed the alienation to people that the Marxists up to that point had wanted to increase to try to get the revolutionaries. He's like, well, in advanced monopoly capitalist countries like this one that are actually prosperous societies, the displacement of the opposition from organized industrial working classes to militant minorities. In other words, shifting from Marxist economic theory to identity politics. He says, well, the society developed and caused that because it stole away the revolutionary potential of the working class who is now actually making good money and having upward mobility and having comfortable lives, which is the one thing that they find most intolerable in neo-Marxism. He says, in the theoretical deviation, meaning the emergence of the second generation of neo-Marxism out of compared to old vulgar Marxism, only reflects this development. What appears as a surface phenomenon is indicative of basic tendencies, which suggest not only different prospects of change, but also a depth and extent of change far beyond the expectations of traditional socialist theory. So he's now casting Marxism into the vulgar Marxism box because we need this new identity politics thing. Society has actually thwarted, basically what he's arguing is that capitalist society has figured out ways to thwart, to absolutely stymie all of the terrible failures of early, actual progress is happening of early industrial capitalism. So now there's no revolutionary consciousness on the working class because the working class isn't getting a bad shake. So therefore we have to use angry minorities doing identity politics. who are gonna be groomed and guided by the liberal, the leftist, I should say, intelligentsia, uh, who have the critical theory that they're learning in elite universities. You can see the entire shift that explains what's happening here, right in this spot. It says, under this aspect, the displacement of the negating forces, remember negating is a Hegelian concept, a negative thinking, we're going to burn down the society so that the golden age can arise from the ashes. Under this aspect, the displacement of the negating forces from their traditional base among the underlying population, rather than being a sign of the weakness of the opposition against the integrating power of advanced capitalism, 
may well be the slow formation of a new base, bringing to the fore the new historical subject, capital S, of change, responding to the new objective conditions, this is all Hegel, with qualitatively different needs and aspirations, and on this base, probably intermittent and preliminary, goals and strategies take shape which re-examine the concepts of democratic parliamentary as well as of revolutionary transformation. This is what he's saying. We are shifting out of vulgar Marxism and into this identity politics-based groomed neo-Marxism. That's what he's saying. And he's saying that the reason is because there's an integrating power in advanced capitalism. In other words, he's saying, without wanting to admit it, capitalism works, everything is going too well, so now the old Marxist, vulgar Marxist economic base isn't where we need to have revolutionary energy. We have to have the slow formation of a new base, which he's already said is going to be rooted in identity politics, wedded to his theoretical structure of the world, the new left that he is becomes known as the father of around the same time. And this is going to bring to the fore the new historical subject of change, which is going to be the oppressed minority, responding to new objective conditions, which are more free, colorblind societies that are post-apartheid, post-civil uh, rights, post-segregation, um, uh, post-Jim Crow. With qualitative and also with material wealth growing very rapidly and people becoming comfortable with a burgeoning middle class in 1969, with qualitatively different needs and aspirations. In other words, people are actually liking their lives, so they have to find a different way to be miserable. And that's what he's saying is happening right here. Forces in transition. That's the the title of the section. He says the modifications and the structure of capitalism alter the basis for the development an organization of potential revolutionary forces, where the traditional laboring classes cease to be the grave diggers of capitalism, this function remains as it were suspended, and the political efforts toward change remain tentative, preparatory not only in a temporal but also in a structural sense. This means that the addresses as well as the immediate goals and occasions of action will be determined by the shifting situation rather than by a theoretically well-founded and elaborated strategy. This determinism, direct consequence of the strength of the system and the diffusion of the opposition, also implies a shift of emphasis toward subjective factors. The development of awareness and needs assumes primary importance. Lived experience, lived reality, subjective, radical subjectivity needs to come to fore. You can feel the anticipation of the postmodern tools in neo-Marxism here, but they don't have them yet. They don't have them yet. The postmodern theorists have not yet struck upon the idea that all knowledge is power, which is, of course, false, but that's central, or that all language is contingent, or that the primacy of lived experience is where reality occurs, and that anything that says otherwise is an assertion of power anyway. They are anticipating those postmodern tools here. Under total capitalist administration and introjection, he writes, the social determination of consciousness is all but complete and immediate. Direct implantation of the latter into the former. Under these circumstances, radical change in consciousness is the beginning. So you have to awaken your critical consciousness if you're going to start trying to tear down this uh, socializing society. Again, the social construction, construction thesis is creeping into their thought. The first step in changing social existence, emergence of the new subject. The new subject. Well, what is the new subject? Well, it's this person who experiences systemic power intersecting later is what we'll see with our new sensibility, intersecting systemic power. They have their lived reality of living in a society that's unequal and unfair and where power dynamics structurally determine their outcomes in addition to the material determinism that they face. Historically, he says, it is again the period of enlightenment prior to material change, a period of education, but education which turns into praxis, demonstration, confrontation, rebellion. So his definition of praxis there, by the way, is demonstration, confrontation, rebellion, putting it into practice, showing up and wrecking things, rebelling. And he says that right now in 1969, when he's writing this, they're in a period of awakening consciousness to a new sensibility that will turn into praxis, turn into demonstration, confrontation, and rebellion. And it's shifting to identity politics to make it happen, which will be groomed and shepherded by 
the leftist intelligentsia, especially the young student leftist intelligentsia, and they are going to create a revolving door between activists and scholars so that when we read in Critical Race Theory and Introduction that on the first page that Critical Race Theory is a movement Critical race theory is a movement of activists and scholars who seek to transform the relationship between race, racism, and power. You can see that what's going on. You can see how it's going on there. It's very, very clear what's going on. Um, they are awakening a racial consciousness, creating a revolving door and com communication between the identity politicians and the theorists. To create a new, um, I don't know, vanguard is I guess the right word for for cracking open and wedging open society. This is why I say critical race theory is a lock pick to open Western civilization for a liberation or communist style revolution. This is why I've said this so many times. This is where you see him laying out that strategy for the new left. The radical transformation, he says, the radical transformation of a social system still depends on the class which constitutes the human base of the process of production. In the advanced capitalist countries, this is the industrial working class. The changes in the composition of this class and the extent of its integration into the system alter not the potential but the actual political role of labor. Revolutionary class in itself but not for itself, objectively but not subjectively, its radicalization will depend on catalysts outside its ranks. The development of a radical political consciousness among the masses is only conceivable, sorry, is conceivable only if and when the economic stability and the social cohesion of the system begin to weaken. Well, didn't that happen? In, say 2008 the development of a radical political consciousness among the masses is conceivable only if and when the economic stability and social cohesion of the system begin to weaken it was the traditional role of the marxist leninist party to prepare the ground for this development the stabilizing and integrating power of advanced capitalism which works and the requirements of peaceful coexistence forced this party to parliamentarize itself, to integrate itself into the bourgeois democratic process, and to concentrate on the economic demands, thereby inhibiting rather than promoting the growth of a radical political consciousness. So now he's saying that capitalism itself made, made communism get organized into a parliament style thing to integrate itself into bourgeois values. You know, they never take responsibility for themselves ever. It wasn't that their ideas were bad. It wasn't that they applied them badly. It wasn't that they, they had terrible terrible approach. It wasn't that their dictatorship of the proletariat with a managed vanguard and stagism it was itself just a stupid idea. No, it was the stabilizing and integrating power of advanced capitalism, which is apparently bad, and the requirements of peaceful coexistence, which is apparently bad, forced the Marxist-Leninist party to integrate itself into bourgeois democratic processes and concentrate on economic demands more than anything else, which thereby inhibits, he says, rather than promoting the growth of a radical political consciousness. Where the latter broke through the party and trade union apparatus, it happened under the impact of outside forces, mainly from among the intelligentsia. The apparatus only followed suit when the movement gained momentum and in order to regain control of it. So now he's saying that co the Communist Party became bureaucratic, it became its own worst enemy, because it actually took on f a form forced upon it by capitalism, and the way that capitalism actually works, and it took radical outsiders to break through and change everything, and then they struggled, mainly among the intelligentsia, their own critical theorists, and then the apparatus, the Communist Party apparatus, only followed suit when those outside movements started to gain momentum, and they only did so to co-opt it. The, the paranoia and the conspiracy theorizing here, although communism is a conspiracy theory, so whatever, it's super high, but... Um, there's so many different things that could be said right now. You could say that this is what happened with the with woke being injected into Occupy Wall Street. For a matter, as a matter of fact, you know that they they realize that the identity politics would, which Marcuse is advocating for here, would absolutely rip apart an actual populist movement for actual economic um, exploitation and destruction that was going on. That actually is at the very heart of the big problems. Like woke is not our big problem. BlackRock and those things are our big problem. And Occupy Wall Street was actually positioned against that. And they sent in the woke to bust that up. 
And now the woke are the vehicle, the lockpick, if you will, by which all of this crap is happening. It was used to bust up left populist. It was used to bust up right populist movements. Uh, and wow, how about that? But it's also the thing that Marcuse is advocating for, the creation of the identity politic intelligentsia fusion. Hmm. No matter how rational this strategy may be, he says, no matter how sensible the desperate effort to preserve strength in the face of the sustained power of corporate capitalism, the strategy testifies to the passivity of the industrial working classes. To the degree of their, in, uh, to the degree of their integration, it testifies to the facts which the official theory so vehemently denies. Under the conditions of integration, the new political consciousness of the vital need for radical change emerges among social groups which, on objective grounds, are relatively free from the integrating conservative interests and aspirations, free for the radical transvaluation of values. Without losing its historical role as the basic force of transformation, the working class in the period of stabilization assumes a stabilizing conservative function, and the catalysts of transformation operate from without. So he's actually doing a dialectical negation of the working class to create room for this new thing, this new identity politics intelligentsia. He's basically, this is woke being born in a very real sense. I know that it, I said woke was forged in mapping the margins, and then that's a different sense where the fusion of postmodern thinking and uh, neo-Marxism happened. But here we see the woke this is really a, the birthplace of, of, of wokeness. It's like, let's tear apart the working class and say that the working class is no longer relevant because obviously the working class in a period of stabilization becomes a stabilizing conservative function, he says. It's only the radical outsiders, the people whose lives are not rising in quality as fast, or the people who are easily manipulated leftist intelligentsia, young people in colleges, that's where the catalyst for transformation now remain. Because people who are building their lives, building their homes, building their families, building their communities, building anything of any value, well, they're conservative now because they want to keep the stuff they built. Because all that hard work that they've done to climb out of dependency, to climb out of suffering, to climb out all that hard work they did so that they could have a nice home and send their kids to college, etc. All of that, that they worked so hard to not have to work so damn hard anymore, they want to keep it. They earned that house and they want to keep it. They earned their life, they want to keep it. They earned the money to buy that cool car they wanted and they want to be able to keep it. So now they're a stabilizing conservative function. And it's their kids, their ingrateful, entitled little bastard kids they send off to college they become the new catalyst for transformation. How? By milking their moral, uh, their, by, well, teaching them systemic thinking, first of all, in the critical theory, and then milking their, uh, their, their, their lack of moral authority by twinging them with radical, uh, angry minority movements and identity politics specifically. This tendency, he says, is strengthened by the changing composition of the working class. The declining proportion of blue-collar labor, the increasing number and importance of white-collar employees, technicians, engineers, and specialists, divides the class. This means that precisely those strata of the working class which bore and still bear the brunt of brute exploitation will perform a gradually diminishing function in the process of production. The intelligentsia obtains an increasingly decisive role in this process, an instrumentalist intelligentsia, but an intelligentsia nevertheless. This new working class, by virtue of its position, could disrupt, reorganize, and redirect the mode and relationships of production. However, they have neither the interest nor the vital need to do so. They are well integrated and well rewarded. Nasty first half of this paragraph. Okay, So he's saying that the working class itself, because they are becoming increasingly successful and more and more of them are shifting out of brute labor and shifting into um, white collar positions like technicians, engineers, and specialists. He says, well, that divides the working class. People who are rising up and they no longer have to experience that brunt, the brunt of brute exploitation. Remember, that's the thing that the Marxists wanted the working class to experience. So they would know their alienation. They would know their suffering. They would know their exploitation, etc. They have to feel the terrible brunt of their exploitation so that they'll want out. 
not take responsibility for their lives, not become successful, not grow out of intolerable conditions, not change systems incrementally to make those intolerable systems much more tolerable and much more successful for them. No, they don't want any of that. They want the revolution. The revolution is all they want. So now they say, oh, well, the working class is being divided because people are being successful. They don't want success. They want people to fail until they become warlords, revolutionaries who are going to overthrow the whole system for their stupid communist fever, a fever dream. And he says, well, the intelligentsia become much more important than educated people, people that are going through our college indoctrination programs. This new working class, by virtue of its position, in other words, privilege, could disrupt, reorganize, and redirect the mode and relationships of production, but they don't have the consciousness for it because they have neither the interest nor the vital need to do so. They are well integrated and well rewarded. This should smack of all that stuff in critical whiteness that you read where they say explicitly, for example, in Richard Delgado and Gene Stefanczyk's Critical Race Theory Introduction, um, it's on the seventh page. I think I could even quickly like pull it up that there is no motivation, they say, for white people to challenge the status quo. No motivation because they're well rewarded by it. They're comfortable. You hear about white comfort all the time in the whiteness studies. How neo-Marxist is this stuff? Well, that's how neo-Marxist this stuff is. I'm trying to rush to page seven so I can actually read what Delgado and Stefanczyk say. I just thought to pull this up. Um, page seven, what do they say? Um, Second, most would agree that our system of white over color ascendancy serves important purposes, both psychic and material. The first feature, ordinariness, means that racism is difficult to cure or address. Colorblind or formal conceptions of equality expressed in rules that insist only on treatment that is the same across the board can thus remedy only the most blatant forms of discrimination, such as mortgage redlining or the refusal to hire a black PhD rather than a white high school dropout that do stand out and attract our attention. The second feature, sometimes called interest convergence or material determinism, adds a further dimension because racism advances the interest of both white elites materially and working class people psychically, large segments of society have little incentive to eradicate it. It's exactly Marcuse's argument. Marcuse's presence, as we might say, definitely was felt where he's talking about this here in the new working class by virtue of its position could disrupt reorganize and redirect the mode and relationships of production. However, they have neither the interest nor the vital need to do so. They are well integrated and well rewarded. Same argument, exactly same argument. People who benefit from the system won't tear it down as if that's anything like maybe the system's working. Maybe the system's working. And his argument here is more and more and more of the working class are succeeding into this position. So how on earth are we ever going to get our revolution? Because the revolution's the only focus for them. So they're having to find new sources, and that's where he's shifting to a well-groomed identity politics movement, led by the neo-Marxists, groomed by the neo-Marxists. So he says, to be sure, monopolistic competition and the race for intensifying the productivity of labor may enforce technological changes which may come into conflict with still prevailing policies and forms of private capitalist enterprise, and these changes may then lead to a technocratic reorganization of large sectors of the society even of its culture and ideology. But it is not clear why they would lead to an abolition of the capitalist system, of the subjugation of the underlying population to the apparatus of profitable production for particular interests. The guy just is, an, is just a communist. He just hates capitalism. So everything has to be twisted back around to how capitalism, even when it's succeeding, is failing. Such a qualitative change, he says, would presuppose the control and redirection of the productive apparatus by groups with needs and goals very different from those of the technocrats. Technocracy, no matter how pure, sustains and streamlines a continuum of domination. This fatal link can only be cut by a revolution which makes technology and technique subservient to the needs and goals of free men. In this sense, and in this sense only, it would be a revolution against technocracy. So again, we have one of those weird ironies, which is kind of what's happening, but the woke are on the wrong side of it, and they're his people. It keeps coming up with Marcuse. It's like, almost like his ideas were terrible. Um, but this is what he's saying. The, the, the key sentence here, such a qualitative change would presuppose the control and redirection of the productive apparatus by groups with needs and goals very different. Dictatorship of the anti-racists, for example. Trans people have very different needs and goals. I shouldn't say trans people, I should say the trans rights activist movement. Qualitative change has to shift control 
in redirection of the productive apparatus into their hands, to the radical revolutionaries, these outsiders that are being groomed by the intelligentsia that are neo-Marxists. He says that such a revolution is not on the agenda. In 1969, apparently it wasn't. He said that in the domain of corporate capitalism, the two historical factors of transformation, the subjective and the objective, do not coincide. They are prevalent in different and even antagonistic groups. The objective factor, that is, the human base of the process of production which reproduces the established society, exists in the industrial working class, the human source and reservoir of exploitation. The subjective factor, that is, the political consciousness, exists among the nonconformist young intelligentsia, and the vital need for change is the very life of the ghetto population, and of the underprivileged sections of the laboring classes in backwards capitalist countries. The two historical factors do coincide in large areas of the third world where the national liberation fronts and the guerrillas fight with the support and participation of the class, which is the base of the process of production, namely the predominantly agrarian and the emerging industrial proletariat. The constellation which prevails in the metropoles of capitalism, namely the objective necessity of radical change, this guy's a nut job. And the paralysis of the masses seems typical of a non-revolutionary but pre-revolutionary situation. The transition from the former to the latter, in other words, to go from non-revolutionary into uh, pre-revolutionary, or maybe pre-revolutionary into revolutionary, presupposes a critical weakening of the global economy of capitalism and the intensification and extension of the political work that is radical enlightenment. So when I keep saying that the point of critical race theory is one and only one thing, which is to produce more critical race theorists, to radically enlighten or create the critical race consciousness, to raise critical consciousness of race, that's what I'm talking about. That's what they do. That's all they do. And we have to weaken the global econo economy of capitalism, he says. So you look at the financial crisis of 2008 and you're like, huh, that was a shock for a lot of people, especially that millennial class who's very upset and dispossessed by it. And if we can just take in those people and intensify and extend the political work of radical enlightenment, then we're in business. So then we can do the dialectical process on the two historical factors of transformation. He's talking about the subjective and the objective, which do not coincide. He says that they're only present in antagonistic groups. So he sees the objective factor where people are having the suffering that is necessary. It's happening in the industrial working class. But the subjective factor where the political consciousness arises exists in the nonconformist young intelligentsia, the educated weirdos that the critical theorists are producing. And then to motivate this, you actually says he needs a vital need for change of life, and that's only happening in the ghetto. You're seeing, he says, the fruits of this these things coinciding in large areas of the third world where the national liberation fronts and guerrillas are basically wrecking other countries. So this is how he's viewing the world. The goal is to weaken capitalism so that it's unstable, to make people uncomfortable while intensifying and extending the raising of critical consciousness in the intelligentsia, so that eventually the conditions will coincide and the revolution will be sparked in Western societies. He says it is precisely the preparatory character of this work which gives it its historical significance to develop in the exploited, the consciousness, and the unconscious, which would loosen the hold of enslaving needs over their existence, the needs which perpetuate their dependence on the system of exploitation. Which is really funny because they fight for things like the Great Society entitlements, they fight for things like affirmative action, which in fact are exactly enslaving needs over their existence that perpetuate their dependence on the system of exploitation. And we're trying the same thing with vaccine passports now, which he would want because he's a leftist, and all the leftists want them. Colina Jones applauded them. She's in the continuum of this line of thought. Without this rupture, he says, which can only be the result of political education and action, even the most elemental, even the most immediate force of rebellion may be defeated or become the mass basis of counter-revolution. And that's what we kind of see happening in Europe right now where they're burning their vaccine passports and people are pissed. And he says the ghetto population of the United States however, constitutes such a force. Confined to small areas of living and dying, it can be more easily organized and directed. 
So does he care about black people? No, he sees them as useful for his movement. Look at how they are. They have such a force. This is where we can get our, our energy. Let's stoke identity politics. Let's groom it in neo-Marxist theory, which is not really for their benefit. It's to create the revolution. Moreover, located in the core cities of this country, he says the ghettos form, a natural, form natural geographic centers from which the struggle can be mounted against the targets of vital economic and political importance. In other words, look, the ghettos are already in cities. Cities are vulnerable. We can, they're so important. They're like net nodes and hubs in important econo in capitalist economies. But we can foment anger and division and problems from within by stoking economic, or stoking identity politics there doesn't matter what the material conditions on their lives are going to be. Look at Detroit. It was getting hollowed out. 50 years later, it's still hollowed out by this being applied there. Black Lives Matter, my ass. That's not what he's talking about. He's like, oh, wow, look at all that energy. We could disrupt cities from within. They did it to Detroit the same year, give or, mind, give or take one or two, I guess, that this essay was written. And it was a failure, complete failure. He says, in this respect, the ghettos can be compared to the Faubourgs of Paris in the 18th century, and their location makes for spreading and contagious upheavals. Wow, that metaphor of the virus comes right back. Cruel and indifferent privation is now met with increasing resistance, but it is still largely, but it's, sorry, it's still largely unpolitical character facilitates suppression and diversion. The radical conflict still separates the ghettos from the allies outside. While it is true that the white man is guilty, it is equally true that white men are rebels and radicals. So he's calling for a fusion of the white leftist intelligentsia with the Black Panthers, the Black Power Movement, the Black Nationalists, the Black Liberation Movement. While it is true that the white man is guilty, it is equally true that white men are rebels and radicals. Antifa teaming up with Black Lives Matter. However, the fact is that monopolistic imperialism validates the racist thesis. It subjects ever more non-white populations to the brutal power of its bombs, poisons, and monies. So bombs and poisons, I kind of get, but I don't know that that I don't know what degree bombs are happening to the ghetto populations in the United States unless he's shifted to the world frame. And monies, is he talking about gentrification? bringing money into their communities and the money is corrupting them. Oh, it's making them capitalists probably. He says, so thus making even the exploited white population in the metropoles partners and beneficiaries of the global crime. Class conflicts are being superseded or blotted out by race conflicts. Color lines become economic and political realities, a development rooted in the dynamic of late imperialism and its struggle for new methods of internal and external colonization. Except we now know that most of that actually occurred not as just a hangover from the terrible policies that preceded the Civil Rights Acts, but rather from the entitlement programs of the Great, uh, of the great Society that were being enacted in a ham-fisted attempt to create something like reparations for those problems. So he's unable to blame, for, blame his own side for the problems, although that's really what you read all through critical race theory is how those things didn't work. The long-range power of the black rebellion is further threatened by the deep division within this class, the rise of a Negro bourgeoisie. In other words, successful black people who, I guess, become conservative, if you will, because they're successful and they worked hard and they want to keep their thing. And this is where you have people who are arguing, you know, pull up your pants, etc., black bourgeoisie, and they don't, the Marxists don't like them. They want to keep, just like they wanted to keep the peasants uncomfortable and starving and accelerate the contradiction so they would realize their exploitation and their alienation and therefore become a revolutionary force. They want to keep the so-called ghetto population down. They want to keep them trapped in patterns of behavior and culture. They want to keep them trapped in uh, cycles of dependency because otherwise they will become a Negro bourgeoisie that actually sees that the society can work for them, and the whole goal is to achieve the revolution by getting people to believe that the society cannot work for them. So this is the long-range power of the Black Rebellion is further threatened by the deep division within this class, the rise of a Negro bourgeoisie, and by its marginal, in terms of the capitalist system, social function. 
The majority of the black population does not occupy a decisive position in the process of production, and the white organizations of labor have not exactly gone out of their way to change this situation. So he's accusing white labor organizations of being racist. He's saying that blacks are not fully integrated into the you know, economic prospects of society. 1969, this was probably largely true, um, but he was incorrect about how that was going to develop over time. In, cynical, in the cynical terms of the system, he says, a large part of this population is expendable. That is to say, it makes no essential contribution to the productivity of the system. Consequently, what that's maybe some people viewed that way, maybe Marcuse viewed it that way, but I don't think that that's the way that that worked out over time. Consequently, the powers that may be, sorry, consequently, the powers that be may not hesitate to apply extreme measures of suppression if the movement becomes dangerous. The fact is that at present and in the United States, the black population appears to be the most natural force of rebellion. And so what he's actually saying that consequently the powers that be sentence is dark, man. He's saying, oh, well, the U.S. doesn't care about the blacks, so if they try to rise up in some kind of rebellion instead of integrating into a black bourgeoisie and they actually become dangerous, well, then they'll be put down. It's not because it's dangerous. It's not because it's damaging. It's not because it's destroying things. No, it's because... Apparently, the powers that be will use extreme measures of suppression because they think those people are expendable. That's not their methods. The leftists, repressive tolerance, the whole point of that is the leftists' methods are never wrong. It's always somehow the system has terrible cynical motivations. He even says, in the cynical terms of the system, which he, he just assumes is cynical, that's his analysis of it, is that, the, that these people are completely non-essential. Of course, when we talk about essential and non-essential, things get a little weird these days after what's happened in the past two year, year and a half, I guess. So anyway, for him, at present in the United States, the black population appears to be the most natural force of rebellion. So this is where we have, like, in critical race theory, them complaining about respectability politics, right? They're wanting to be able to make demands. They're wanting to be able to protest. They're wanting to be able to block roads, even to hospitals and airports. They're wanting to be able to throw gigantic fits. That's Black Lives Matter. They're wanting to be able to loot, riot, burn, and arson and all of this. Um, they want to be completely unaccountable to the law. They want to be able to shoplift. They want to be able to, and I'm not talking about black people. Of course, I'm talking about Black Lives Matter and these radical leftist activists want to, in defense of looting is a book they wrote. Um, they want to be able to be outside of the range of so-called respectable politics because people like Marcuse convinced them in their grooming that respectable politics is the system trying to keep them from becoming dangerous because if they became dangerous, they might actually be able to overthrow the system. So then he says, it's distance from the, meaning the, the black population, it's distance from the young middle class opposition is formidable in every respect. The common ground, the total rejection of the existing society, of its entire value system, is obscured by the obvious class difference. So in, anticipating white privilege here. Just as within the white population, the community of real interest between the students and the workers is vitiated by the class conflict. In other words, the kids are bourgeois, and they're not going to work with those gross working class people that they don't even know any. However, this community did realize itself in political action on a rather large scale during the May Rebellion in France against the implicit injunction on the part of the Communist Party and the CGT, which is like the big labor union, Confederation Generale du Travail, so it's like the big laborers union. Um, it's like, I think, I looked it up briefly, I think it's like a union of labor unions is where all the protests and things uh, and, and uh, strikes are kind of coordinated against the implicit injunction of the Communist Party and the CGT, and the common action was initiated by the students, not by the workers. In other words, a student revolt in May of 1968, which kind of was a disaster, um, they're holding up as, as an example. He's held it up as an example in other places, too. Uh, like at the end, the, the, the 1968 postscript added to repressive tolerance mentions it. This fact may be indicative of the depth and unity of the opposition underneath and across class conflicts. With respect to the student movement, a basic trend in the very structure of advanced industrial society favors a gradual development of such a community of interests. The long-range process which, in large areas of material production, tends to replace heavy physical labor by technical mental energy, increases the social need for scientifically trained intelligent workers. A considerable part of the student population is prospective working class, new working class. 
not only not expendable, but vital for the growth of the existing society, essential workers, if you will. The student rebellion hits this society at a vulnerable point. Accordingly, the reaction is venomous and violent. In other words, it gets put down. So he's arguing that the creative class is going to be the site of the new rebellion. So when the creative class, these entitled students start being rebellious turds, society gets mad at them. And he says this is because it indicates a vulnerability in society because we're shifting to a new economy where those are primarily the working class, and so that has to be suppressed. The student movement, he says, the term, the very term is already ideological and derogatory. It conceals the fact that quite important sections of the older intelligentsia and of the non-student population take active parts in the movement. I think he's like butthurt that he's not being rec represented by the phrase the student movement here. Let's just read that again because I think it's just Marcuse being butthurt here that he's not getting praise. The student movement, that's in scare quotes, the very term is already ideological and derogatory. It conceals the fact that quite important sections of the older intelligentsia, like me, and of the non-student population take active part in the movement. It proclaims very different goals and aspirations. The general demands for educational reforms are only the immediate expression of wider and more fundamental aims. The most decisive difference is between the opposition in the socialist and that in the capitalist countries. He's going to praise the socialists and put down the capitalists. What a shock. The former, so the socialist countries, accepts the socialist structure of society, but protests against the repressive authoritarian regime of the state and party bureaucracy. I do not think that that's actually what was really going on in, er, in socialist shitholes. But that's what he sees. The former, the socialist people, accept the socialist structure of society and protest against the repressive authoritarian regime of the state and party bureaucracy. Like, that's not a necessary part of what's going on. While in the capitalist countries, he says, the militant and apparently increasing part of the movement is anti-capitalist, socialist, or, anar or anarchist. Again, within the capitalist orbit, the rebellion against fascist and military dictatorships in Spain and Latin American countries has a strategy and goals different from the rebellion in the democratic countries. And one should never forget that the one student rebellion which was instrumental in perpetrating the most despicable mass murder in the contemporary world, the massacre of hundreds of thousands of communists in Indonesia. That crime has not yet been punished, and it is the only horrible exception from the libertarian liberating function of student activism. Like record scratch or whatever the sound is, like the fuck are you talking about? You're writing this in 1969 in the middle of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, and you're saying the only student rebellion which was 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 bad that instrumental in perpetua, uh, perpetrating the most despicable mass murder in the contemporary world was the massacre of hundreds of thousands of communists in indonesia a crime that has not yet been punished you're writing this literally as tens of millions of chinese are being murdered and starved in the cultural revolution of china which was a student-led movement a student rebellion are you out of your mind? The Chinese Red Guard was running roughshod over China. 1966 through 1976 was the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Possibly as many as 100 million people died. It was a student movement, a student rebellion against the old people in society. But no, hundreds of thousands of communists died in Indonesia, and that's the only example of a student movement that's ever gone bad, and it's a crime that hasn't been punished because it's against communists. It's a crime. And it's the, he says, it is the only horrible exception from the libertarian liberating function of student activism, which literally while he, while he was writing this, was destroying China. In the fascist and semi-fascist countries, he says, the militant students, a minority of the students everywhere, find support among the industrial and agrarian pro proletariat. In France and Italy, they have uh, been able to obtain precarious and passing aid from powerful leftist parties and unions. In West Germany and in the United States, they meet with the vociferous and often violent hostility of, scare quotes, the people, and of organized labor. Yeah, West Germany is against communism? What a shock. Revolutionary in its theory and its instincts and in its ultimate, ultimate goals, the student movement is not a revolutionary force, perhaps not even an avant-garde, so long as there are no masses capable and willing to follow. 
but it is the ferment of hope in the overpowering and stifling capitalist metropoles. It testifies to the truth of the alternative, the real need, and the real possibility of a free society. So you have the most entitled students who won't even mix, he said, with the working class, who have a huge unwillingness to mix with racial minorities that are somehow testifying, the most entitled sector of society, somehow testifying to the truth of the real need and the real possibility of a free society. They are the freest people on the planet. And neo-Marxism infected their stupid brains in their entitlement because communism in general is a disease of the lower upper class, of the not quite most privileged people in society because it taps into their their ineffectiveness. It taps into their, their insecurity that they're not as good as their standing, social standing says, but that they're craving to be at that top that they aren't. And it can't possibly be them, the bourgeois people. It's not, it can't possibly be them. That's the failure. It has to be that the system is screwing them from being top elites and making sure that their self-esteem is attended to and that their guilt is assuaged and that their low talent is recognized for the glory that it is and rewarded. This guy is totally mental. He says, to be sure, there are the wild ones and the non-committed, the escapists into all kind of mysticism, the good fools and the bad fools, and those who don't care what happens. There are the authentic and the organized happenings and the non-conformities. Naturally, he says, the market has invaded this rebellion and made it a business. But it is serious business nevertheless. What matters is not the more or less interesting psychology of the participants, psychopathology of the participants, or the often bizarre forms of the protest, which frequently make the absurd reasonableness of the establishment and the anti-heroic sensuous images of the alternative more transparent than the most serious argument could do. I love that he's always bringing up that the, 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 his communism, his liberation is going to be sensuous. He's so gross. I digress. What matters is not the more or less interesting psychology of the participants, nor the often bizarre forms of the protest, but that against which the protest is directed. That's what he says. The demands for a structural reform of the educational system, urgent enough by themselves, we shall come back to them subsequently, to seek to counteract the deceptive neutrality and often plainly apologetic teaching, and to provide the student with the conceptual instruments for a solid and thorough critique of the material and intellectual culture. So we're demands for structural reforms of the education system to become critical theory is what he's saying is happening. At the same time, they seek to abolish the class character of education. These changes would lead to an extension and development of consciousness, again, making people critical theorists, which would remove the ideological and technical, technological veil that hides the terrible features of affluent society. So affluent society, a rich society, everybody's doing way better than they otherwise would. Most people are comfortable. Most people feel like they can do something with their lives. Most people are becoming happy and, and content with this. No, there's an ideological and technical technological veil that hides their terrible features that it's still based on capitalism rather than communism. And we need to change the education system to teach critical theory and to teach it to people who don't even that aren't like it says to uh, the class character of education, we're going to abolish that. So to people all the way across the class spectrum, we're going to raise critical consciousness. We're going to make education ideological in order to break through in a critical theory way so that we can un uncover the hidden ideological and technological veil that hides the terrible features of your good life. That's their goal. That's what they've actually achieved. That's what they turned college into. The development of a true consciousness is still the professional function of universities. No wonder, then, that the student opposition meets with all but pathological hatred on the part of the so-called community, including large sections of organized labor, to the, de to the degree to which the university becomes dependent on the financial and political goodwill of the community and of the government, the struggle for a free and critical education becomes a vital part in the struggle for change. That decoupling, or the, the federal underwriting, I should say, of student loans, so decoupling financial responsibility thing seems to have, that, that Bill Clinton signed, really seems to have opened up some doors here. Because he says, to the degree to which the university becomes dependent on the financial and political goodwill of the community and of the government, 
the struggle for a free and critical education becomes a vital part. Well, all of a sudden, when you decouple that, you're off to the races. He says, what appears as an extraneous politicalization of the university by disrupting radicals, turning it into a critical theory indoctrination mill, is today, as it was so often in the past, the logical internal dynamic of education. Translation of knowledge into reality of humanistic values into humane conditions of existence. So he says turning universities into critical theory mills is exactly what the point of education has always been. That's the internal dynamic of, of education is to make it about critical theory, to connect the is to the ought. And we're going to hear that in just a second. This dynamic arrested by the pseudo natural features of academia would, for example, be released by the inclusion into the curriculum of courses giving adequate treatment to the great nonconformist movements in civilization and to, the critical analysis and to the critical analysis of contemporary societies. We could fix all of education, this pseudo-neutral, pseudo I said natural, my bad, pseudo-neutral features of academia could all be release, released just by turning them into critical theory m machines to raise critical consciousness in the stupid kids. The groundwork for building the bridge between the ought and the is between theory and practice. So theory is the ought, practice is the is. Praxis is the wedding of theory and practice. The groundwork for building the bridge between the ought, theory, and the is, practice, is laid within theory itself. This is what I'm telling you. There is no such thing as a critical theory that isn't also a critical praxis. And this is the connection of is and ought. This is the forging of what should be epistemology into axiology. This is the, another, sorry, this is the transmission of the, the, the creation of that second dimensional critical theory on top of, of, of uh, traditional theory, where it's the reason above understanding of Hegel, where the system, the, the systematic philosophy or the systematic theology really of the critical theory tradition has to be laid down and it's part of the theory itself it's inseparable that's why you cannot just teach about a critical theory without doing it unless what you're doing is what i'm doing which is actually exposing it and criticizing it there's no way to teach critical race theory from a position of critical race theory without doing the bridge between the ought and the is where you are in Introjecting, in his own words, the values of critical thought, meaning critical theory thought, into what you're actually trying to teach. Math has to become about critical theory. The ought has to be injected into the is. Theory and practice have to be wedded. So the the moral vision, the idealized vision, the utopian vision that he calls for at the beginning of this section, as a matter of fact, has to be there, and it has to be put into practice. That's the bridge between the ought and the is, and that is laid, he said, within the critical theory itself. Knowledge, he says, is transcendent toward the object world, toward reality, not only in an epistemological sense as against repressive forms of life, it is political. Knowledge is political. We're now really anticipating the postmodern here. So when postmodernism comes along, the neo-Marxists are really ready to wed to this thing. Denial, he says, of the right to political, political activity in the university perpetuates the separation between theoretical and practical reason, I just mentioned reason, and reduces the effectiveness and the scope of intelligence. If you can't be political in your education, if you can't be political in the university, if you can't turn the university into a political project, then you separate the theoretical and practical reason. You separate the ought from the is. You're not just learning. You are no longer operating the university as a church, or if I were Moldbug, we'd say a cathedral. This is where this is being born, and at least in terms of turning the university into a giant church, using the social sciences and humanities uh, perverted into critical theory um, as the main uh, doxa of that church. The educational demands thus drive the movement beyond the universities into the streets, the slums, the community. That's in quotes. 
and the driving force is a refusal to grow up, to mature, to perform efficiently and normally in and for a society which compels the vast majority of the population to earn their living in stupid, inhuman, and unnecessary jobs, which conducts its booming business on the back of ghettos, slums, and internal and external colonialism, which is infested with violence and repression while demanding obedience and compliance from the victims of violence and repression, which in order to sustain the profitable productivity on which its hierarchy depends utilizes its vast resources for waste, destruction, and an ever more methodical creation of conformist needs and satisfactions. So here we have a huge rant, and I think he does the huge rant with all that moral uh, condemnation of capitalism specifically to hide what he actually said at the beginning of the sentence. The driving force is the refusal to grow up, to mature, to perform efficiently and normally in and for a society which compels the vast majority of the population to earn their living in jobs. That's what he said. The driving force of liberation is the refusal to grow up, to mature, to perform efficiently and normally in and for a society which compels the vast majority of the population to earn their living in stupid, inhuman, and unnecessary jobs. That's his that's it. Then he goes on this several, you know, maybe hundred word long rant in a single sentence to hide the fact that he says the point of a critical theory is to convince people not to grow up, not to take responsibility for their life, not to get a job, not to contribute to the society because they're supposed to think the whole society is evil. They're supposed to think they're better than that crappy. What does he say? This crappy, stupid, inhuman, unnecessary job. You're supposed to be better than that. You're the intelligentsia. You're not supposed to grow up or mature. You're supposed to stay a petulant, angry child and not earn a living. That's what you should be demanding. That's what liberation's about for Herbert Marcuse. To the degree to which the rebellion is directed against a functioning, prosperous, democratic society, it is a moral rebellion. Shall I read that again? To the degree to which the rebellion is directed against a functioning, prosperous, democratic society, it is a moral rebellion against the hypocritical, aggressive values and goals, against the blasphemous religion of this society, against everything it takes seriously, everything it professes while violating what it professes. Don't grow up. Don't get a job. Don't mature rebel against a functioning, prosperous, democratic society that's moral. Now, you could say there's a double meaning to moral here. He means it's a rebellion in the moral dimension. But no, you can't, because he says it is a moral rebellion against the hypocritical, aggressive values and goals, against the blasphemous religion of the society, against everything it takes seriously. That's what liberation is about. That's Marcuse's project. Don't grow up, stay a petulant child, don't get a job, hate everything. Hate the very idea of a functioning, prosperous, democratic society. That's the moral thing to do. It is a complete inversion of civic values so that he can have some kind of socialist, communist, fantasy, utopia that he explicitly said throughout this entire essay, but also at the beginning of the section, is his goal. The unorthodox character, this is my favorite part, by the way, Because he literally calls his own movement Clown World, and I'm not kidding. Not quite explicitly, but we're going to get there. He's going to call his own movement Clown World. The unorthodox character of this opposition, which does not have the traditional class basis, and which is at the same time a political, instinctual, and moral rebellion, shapes the strategy and scope of the rebellion. It extends to the entire organization of the existing liberal parliamentary democracy. Among the new left... A strong revulsion against traditional politics prevails, against that whole network of parties, committees, and pressure groups on all levels, against working within this network and with its methods. The entire sphere and atmosphere, with all its power, is invalidated. Nothing that any of these politicians, representatives, or candidates declares is of any relevance to the rebels. They cannot take it seriously, although they know very well that they may mean them, or that it, that it may mean to them getting beaten, going to jail, or losing a job. They are not professional martyrs. They prefer not to be beaten, not to go to jail, not to lose their job. But for them, this is not a question of choice. The protests and refusal are parts of their metabolism. 
because they've been made psychopathological. They can't function in normal life any longer because they've been groomed by critical theory to be psychopathological and not to be able to do so. So protest and refusal are parts of their metabolism. And they extend to the power structure as a whole because it's a power structure that is at fault. It's, they, they can't take responsibility because then they have to participate in it. It's so evil. The democratic process organized by this structure is discredited to such an extent that no part of it can be extracted which is not contaminated. Moreover, using this process would divert energy to snail-paced movements. For example, electioneering with the aim of significantly changing the composition of the U.S. Congress might take 100 years. Look like it take 50, actually. Judging by the present rate of progress, they didn't assume on computer voting and mail-in ballots, apparently. And assuming that the effort of political radicalization continues unchecked. And the performance of the courts from the lowest to the highest does not mitigate the distrust in the given democratic constitutional setup. Under these circumstances, to work for the improvement of the existing democracy easily appears as indefinitely delaying attainment of the goal of creating a free society. So in other words, we need a revolution. We need revolutionaries. It's always all about the revolution. That's communism in a nutshell. It's all about that purification, that step of purification, the revolution that's going to overturn the whole society. It's a rapture. It's a rapture. And on the other side of the rapture, there can be a tribulation, and we call it socialism or anti-racism or equity or whatever, where people fight it all out. But in the end, we enter into the utopia of communism or liberation or non-bureaucratic socialism or whatever the, the heck they want to call it racial justice, and critical race theory. Here we are. Thus, in some sectors of the opposition, the radical protest tends to become antinomian, anarchistic, even non-political. Now, let me pause before we get to the clown world part, because antinomian is not an everyday word for people. So you, you have to appreciate what that word means. It means, antinomian means that it means that you're above the law. It means that you perceive yourself to be so moral that you don't have to follow the rules, that you have, you're have you above the law, you're above the rules. It's usually tied to people who believe they have a religious conviction uh, or a religious mandate from God to be above the law. And this is what he says is the characteristic of his movement. Paying attention to the existing structure is immoral, so they're going to rise above that. So he says, the radical protest tends to become antinomian, anarchistic, and even non-political. Here is another reason why the rebellion often takes on the weird and clownish forms which get on the nerves of the establishment. Clown world. Do, 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 do. Here is another reason why the rebellion often takes on the weird and clownish forms which get on the nerves of the establishment. In the face of the gruesomely serious totality of institutionalized politics, satire, irony, and laughing provocation become a necessary dimension of the new politics. The contempt for the deadly esprit de seru, in other words, seriousness, which permeates the talkings and doings of the professional and semi-professional politicians appears as contempt for the values which they profess while destroying them. In other words, we're going to be more and more postmodern, politics of parody, etc. The rebels revive their desperate laughter and the cynical defiance of the fool as a means for demasking the deeds of the serious ones who govern the whole. He literally called his own movement Clown World. Critical Theory, Clown World. Who said? Herbert Marcuse, critical theorist. Godfather of the New Left. This alienation of the radical opposition from the existing democratic process and institutions suggests a thorough re-examination of democracy, bourgeois democracy, meaning representative government, that's what he says, and of their role in the transition from capitalism to socialism or generally from an unfree to a free society. Capitalism, unfree society. Socialism, free society. That's what he said. And we have to have a thorough re-examination of democracy, which he says we're right now live in bourgeois democracy, which is representative government. We need to get away from that. We need to have a true democracy, in, which happens after we transition from capitalism to socialism, from an unfree to a free society. Clown world. By and large, Marxian theory has a positive evaluation of the role of bourgeois democracy in this transition, up to the stage of revolution itself. By virtue of its commitment, however limited in practice, to civil rights and liberties, bourgeois democracy provides the most favorable ground for the development and organization of dissent. Whoa. Whoa. They know what they're doing. They know they are taking advantage of the best 
virtues of this is why they're evil. They know what they're doing. They know they are taking advantage of the best virtues of free liberal societies to use those things against them to have their stupid revolution. By and large, he says, Marxian theory has a positive evaluation of the role of bourgeois democracy in this transition up to the stage of revolution itself. By virtue of its commitment to civil rights and liberties, bourgeois democracy, meaning representative government, provides the most favorable ground for the development and organization of dissent. They will let a free society will let them organize and do this crap, and therefore it's the best way to get their stupid revolution. This, he says, is still true. But the forces which vitiate the protective features within the democratic framework itself are gaining momentum. The mass democracy developed by monopoly capitalism has shaped the rights and liberties which it grants in its own image and interest. The majority of the people is the majority of their masters. Deviations are easily contained, and concentrated power can afford to tolerate, perhaps even defend, radical dissent as long as the latter complies with the established rules and manners and even a little beyond it. The opposition is thus sucked into the very world which it opposes, and by the very mechanisms which allow its development and organization, the opposition, without a mass basis, is frustrated in its, eff its efforts to obtain such a mass basis. Under these circumstances, working according to the rules and methods of democratic legality appears as surrender to the prevailing power structure. So we need Black Lives Matter and Antifa. And yet, it would be fatal to abandon the defense of civil rights and liberties within the established framework. I see a dialectical process happening. Unlike traditional approaches to civil rights, which embrace step-by-step -step progress and incrementalism, critical race theory calls into question the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning, enlightenment rationalism, and neutral principles of constitutional law. So when I say that, and I say that it rejects those, people jump at me and say, no, it doesn't. It just calls them into question. It says calls into question. It doesn't say rejects. Come on. And under these circumstances, working to working according to the rules and methods of democratic legality appears as surrender to the prevailing power structure, and yet it would be fatal to abandon the defense of civil rights and liberties within the established framework. Uh huh. They're evil. But as monopoly capitalism is compelled to extend and fortify its dominion at home and abroad, the democratic struggle will come to an increasing con come into increasing conflict with the existing democratic institutions, with its built-in barriers and conservative dynamic. The semi-democratic process, so now he's no longer calling it bourgeois democracy, it's now semi-democratic. The semi-democratic process works of necessity against radical change because it produces and sustains a popular majority whose opinion is generated by the dominant interests in the status quo. In other words, as life works for more and more people, people don't want to screw it up. So they like what's going on. And therefore, you only have a semi-democratic process because it actually works against radical change that people don't want because stuff is working. As long as this condition prevails, it makes sense to say that the general will is always wrong. These people absolutely hate the idea that people would be happy in a system that is fundamentally capitalist. As long as this condition prevails, meaning people are having a good life, it makes sense to say that the general will to keep their good life is always wrong. Wrong in as much as it objectively counteracts the possible transformation of society into a more humane way of life. Communism. Wrong in as much as it objectively counteracts a possible transformation of society into socialism, communism, liberation, whatever. Liking capitalism that's working for you is always wrong because it counteracts the possible transformation of society into, quote, more humane ways of life, meaning communism. To be sure, he says, the method of persuasion is still open to the minority, but it is fatal. The minority is not like the minority. It is the political minority. It is the radicals. It is politically black, not black. It is woke, not on the left. The method of persuasion is still open to the minority, but it's fatally reduced by the fact that the leftist minority does not possess the large funds required for equal access to the mass media, which speak day and night for the dominant interests. Funny how that changed. With those wholesome interludes in favor of the opposition that buttress the illusory faith in the prevailing equality and fair play. And yet, 
Without the continuous effort of persuasion of reducing one by one the hostile majority, the prospects of the opposition would still be darker than they are. Dialectics of democracy. I told you this is all dialectical. Very Hegel. If democracy means self-government to free people with justice for all, then the realization of democracy would presuppose abolition of the existing pseudo-democracy. Remember, that's representative government. In the dynamic of corporate capitalism, the fight for democracy thus tends to assume anti-democratic forms. This is why it's a dialectic. The fight for democracy requires anti-democracy. And to the extent to which the democratic decisions are made in parliaments on all levels, the opposition will tend to become extra-parliamentary. Critical race theory calls into question the very foundations of the liberal order, including equality theory, legal reasoning. Okay. The movement to extend constitutionally professed rights and liberties to the daily life of the oppressed minorities, even the movement to preserve existing rights and liberties, will become subversive to the degree to which it will meet the stiffening resistance of the majority against an exaggerated interpretation and application of equality and justice. So... We have to, in other words, to achieve true free democracy, which is socialism, we have to take existing bourgeois democracy, which is pseudo-democracy, and meet it with anti-democracy, which means operating outside of the democratic thing and pissing on respectability politics, pissing on the existing ways of doing things, maybe signing thousands of executive orders or whatever's going on. We have to be anti-democratic. We have to be totalitarian. We have to be dictators in order to do so in a way that's going to produce a true democracy that exists within socialism because the current democracy is not a true democracy because this is their thought process. This is their thought process. An opposition which is directed not against a particular form of government or a particular or against particular conditions within a society, but against a given social system as a whole cannot remain legal and lawful because it is the established legality and the established law which it opposes. So now he's calling for lawlessness and uh, illegality. The fact that the democratic process provides for the redress of grievances and for legal and lawful changes does not alter the illegality inherent in an opposition to an institutionalized democracy which halts the progress of change at the stage where it could destroy the existing system. So you won't let us wreck the entire system. You want to maintain the system, therefore you're evil. And that is actually oppression and repression. So we have to be, and are justified in being, illegal and unlawful. Same kind of repressive tolerance argument that we saw from before. By virtue of this built-in stabilizer or governor, he's using that I'm sure as a pun, capitalist mass democracy is perhaps to a higher degree self-perpetuating than any other form of government or society. I said that it's an unstable equilibrium. And the more so, the more it rests not on terror and scarcity, but on efficiency and wealth. Remember, if you're having a society that works, that's bad. If it were relying on terror and scarcity, we'd have a revolution. And on the majority will of the underlying and administered population. So remember, he doesn't, because of false consciousness, he believes that the existing democratic situation is brainwashing people into liking the life that they actually have that's actually pretty good, where they feel proud of their work and they're glad they did it and they got a reasonably good wage and they're able to buy things that they want. They're able to have a comfortable life. No, 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 that's bad, that's bad, that's bad, that's what he says. That's administered population. That's the system itself creating the conditions of stability and such that it wants. Stability, plenty, prosperity, etc. That's administered because there's a power that be that maintains the system and it's not allowing the communism, which is other more humane ways of being, according to him, free, true freedom. This new situation has direct bearing on the old question as the as to the right of resistance. Can we say it is the established system rather than the resistance to it, which is in need of justification? Such systems seem to be the implication of the social contract theories which consider civil societies dissolved when, in its existing form, it no longer fulfills the functions for which it was set up, namely as a system of socially necessary and productive repression. Theoretically, these functions were determined by the philosophers. The realistically minded defined the end of government as a, as a protection of property, trade, and commerce. The idealists spoke to the real, uh, realization of reason, justice, freedom, all capitalized, without altogether neglecting or even minimizing the more material 
and economic aspects, and both schools' judgment as to whether a government actually fulfilled these ends and the criteria for judging were usually limited to a particular nation-state or type of nation-state, which the uh, respective philosopher had in mind, that the security, growth, and freedom of the one nation-state involved the insecurity, destruction, or oppression of another did not invalidate their definition, nor did an established government lose its claim for obedience when when the protection of property and the realization of reason left large parts of the population in poverty and servitude. So he says... I mean, this is unbelievable. I'll just leave that there. In the contemporary period, the questions as to the end of government have subsided. It seems that the continued functioning of the society is sufficient justification for its legality and its claim for obedience. Now, it has nothing to do with the fact that it works, that it's actually creating success, it's actually raising most boats, it's actually destroying many of the terrors that people have let, that the society works, doesn't it? No, no, no. The, the continued functioning of society is sufficient justification for its legality and its claim for obedience. And its obedience is, you know, just follow some basic laws, you know, otherwise you're free. Minimal government is really the American ideal. He says, and functioning seems defined rather negatively as the absence of civil war, massive disorder, economic collapse. In other words, if it was communism, it would be functioning way better. So they lie to themselves and say, look, our society is functioning. Look at all this prosperity because he believes that communism is going to be idealistic and utopian. Therefore, this crap where he gets to wander around Santa Monica and how beautiful everything is and how everybody, he has lots of money and all these adoring fans and he sells hundreds of thousands of books, etc. All that's just, that's functioning according to a crappy definition. He says, because otherwise anything goes. Military dictatorship, plutocracy, government by gangs and rackets, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity are not effective arguments against a government which protects property, trade, and commerce at home while it perpetrates its destructive policy abroad. So he's claiming that, you know, Americans maybe have great lives for themselves, but look how they're destroying the rest of the world. So you're starting to see that imperialist aspect of new left thinking creeping in here as the wedge that he's going to try to break things apart. And indeed, there is no enforceable law that could deprive such a constitutional government of its legitimacy and legality. But this means that there is no enforceable law other than that which serves the status quo, and that those who refuse to refuse such service are AO ipso outside of the realm of law, even before they come into actual conflict with the law. So, um, what he's doing, of course, I said he's driving this wedge, right? And he's saying, well, there's no way to call the United States, for example, or Western societies illegitimate, these wonderful constitutional republics. There's no way to call them illegitimate, even though they're doing awful things other parts of the world. So there's the wedge that he wants to drive. And he says, there's literally nothing that you could do. Everything is just going to say, no, 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 this society needs to function. It's not that these values that the, the thing is based on would produce prosperity otherwise. And in fact, what he's envisioning as the alternative, of course, is a global communist utopia. And he says, you know, if we were all global communist utopia, then we would not have all these wars. There would not be conflicts across nations. There wouldn't be issues around trade or exploitation or whatever the other things he thinks are just all these terrors of imperialism. And it's not to say that there's not criticism to be laid upon like the imperial maneuvers of especially the, the, the neocon regime that hadn't yet arisen when he was writing this, um, though the military-industrial complex was kind of grinding up into action to a degree. Uh, there are legitimate criticisms, but his criticism is, well, it's not a global communism where everything's perfect, so therefore there's no legitimate criticism allowed because we have to perpetuate evils. This is the standard kind of critical theory nonsense. He says, The absurd situation. The established democracy still provides the only legitimate framework for change and must therefore be defended against all attempts on the right and the center to restrict this framework, but at the same time, preservation of the established democracy preserves the status quo and containment of change. This is why I did that podcast a long time ago, over a year ago, where I said that in liberalism there is no status quo. This is one of the central myths that they have. They hold up liberalism as though it's a status quo, but liberalism is in fact a moving object. It is, in fact, something that is solving problems. It is working out difficulties. It is saying, oh, wow, we thought this works, and then there are still some problems, and let's see what we can do to improve, because it allows the question. It allows people to challenge the existing power structure with legal means that minimize conflict. If you look at liberalism as a conflict-minimizing strategy, it is basically second to none as far as large political conflict 
uh, conflict management strategies go. And he's like, no, 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 that's terrible because it's a status quo. Another aspect, he says, of the same ambiguity, radical change depends on a mass basis. But ever, So you have to have a mass movement in order to have a revolution. That's what he's saying. But every step in the struggle for radical change isolates the opposition from the masses and provokes intensified repression, mobilization of, the insti- of institutionalized violence against the opposition. I wonder if he's thinking of like Angela Davis getting sent to jail uh, for helping to kidnap a federal judge or whatever thus further diminishing the prospects for radical change. After the electoral triumph of the reaction over the left and the aftermath of the French Student Rebellion, Humanité wrote, according to the Los Angeles Times, June 25th, 1968, quote, every barricade, every car burned gave tens of thousands of votes to the Gaullist party. Yeah, people don't like your stupid revolutions, Marcuse. People don't like civil unrest. People are not happy about the the, the looting, the rioting, the burning, the accusations that whiteness is property so we can destroy it in, in, in direct copying of the communist manifesto of the abolition of private property especially bourgeois property which is what we understand whiteness as property to mean because that's exactly what is meant by it once you center race as the central construct for understanding inequality according to gloria ladson billings as the point of critical race theory people aren't freaking happy with it they weren't happy with it in the 1960s when you burned out parts of france when you burned out freaking um parts of los angeles when you burned out parts of most of the center of detroit people don't like it and yeah they, then they vote for the other side and yeah, it does open up the possibility that actual reactionary movements are going to fill the vacuum if nobody is strong enough in the sensible middle to take a stand against you freaking lunatics that nobody in their right mind wants in charge except you. But I said, whoops, in your right mind. And you're not. You're actually mentally ill, crazy people. And it's perfectly clear in your writing that you are. No, you are not right. You are not correct. Your extra legality, your extra... Uh, whatever the heck you're talking about is just not acceptable to most people most of the time because they do like stability. They do like functioning societies. They do like to have a opportunity that works out. They do like prosperity. They don't want to be miserable. They don't want to accelerate the contradictions and they don't believe in your fucking stupid utopian project that you think is going to work that's definitely never going to work. And is you just praised student rebellions and student movements in this essay saying they've never done anything bad except for the one time they attacked communism in the exact same time that somebody's killing tens of millions of people in China using one. You're, nobody wants your crap. This is why we should all freaking resist the woke. We should all resist all of this neo-Marxist garbage. They're utterly out of their marbles. They don't, they're, they don't know what they're talking about. And it's not going to be good. And he says this is perfectly correct. As perfectly correct as the corollary proposition that without the barricades and car burnings, the ruling powers would be safer and stronger. So cynical. It's all about the ruling powers. It's not about citizens wanting a stable place to live, a place to make their businesses, to have their lives, to have their homes, to raise their children, to send their children to school without having their minds warped, to become productive members of a society that's actually pretty good to live in, that you keep acknowledging is good to live in. It's as perfectly correct as the corollary proposition that without the barricades and car burnings, the ruling powers would be safer and stronger, and the opposition, absorbed and restricted by the parliamentary game, would further emasculate and pacify the masses on whom the change depends. Oh yeah, you're so great for us. Antifa's doing everybody so well. God, I hate this guy. The conclusion, the radical opposition inevitably faces defeat of its direct extra-parliamentary action of civil... Oh, sorry, of uncivil disobedience, and there are situations in which it must take the risk of such defeat. If in, doing, if in doing so, it can consolidate its strength and expose the destructive character of civil obedience to a reactionary regime. It's like this guy lives in the most tortured nightmare world where he thinks that free societies are a terrible, what does he call them, a reactionary regime, and that everybody's demanded civil obedience to a terrible reactionary regime because it's not communist. And so we have to have uncivil disobedience, and sometimes it's worth it, he says. For it is precisely the objective historical function, invoking Hegel and Marx, of the democratic system of corporate capitalism to use the law and order of bourgeois liberalism as a counter-revolutionary force, thus imposing upon the radical opposition the necessity of direct action and uncivil disobedience, Antifa, 
while confronting the opposition with its vastly superior strength. They don't call it uncivil disobedience anymore, by the way. They call it beautiful trouble or good trouble. And you hear our democratic politicians saying that they want to make good trouble or that they want to do beautiful trouble. They don't call it uncivil disobedience anymore. They call it good trouble. But that's what's going on here. Under these circumstances, he says, direct action and uncivil disobedience become for the rebels integral parts of the transformation of the indirect democracy of corporate capitalism into a direct democracy in which elections and representation no longer serve as institutions of domination. But that's only going to work when we have perfect communism and everybody's on the same page. As against the latter, direct action becomes a means of democratization, of change even within the established system. Do you understand that this is as anti-American as you can get? This is the attempt to destroy democratic republics and replace them with communism. That's all this is. All its power, he says, could not silence the student opposition, weakest and most diffused of all historical oppositions. And there is good reason to believe that it was not the parliamentary and the Gallup poll opinion, but rather that this, but rather the students and the resistance which enforced the change in attitude of the government toward the war in Vietnam. And it was the uncivil disobedience of the students of Paris which suddenly broke through the memory repression of organized labor and recalled for a very short moment the historical power of the general strike and the factory occupation of the red flag and the international. Communism. The alternative is not democratic evolution versus radical action, but rationalization of the status quo versus change. Rationalization of the status quo versus change. Reframing it right into their stupid belief that they're on the right path and everybody else is a reactionary trying to uphold a system that's terrible. As long as a social system reproduces by indoctrination and integration a self-perpetuating conservative majority, the majority reproduces the system itself, open to changes within but not beyond its institutional framework. That's the idea of a nation, yeah. Okay. Consequently, the struggle for changes beyond the system becomes, by virtue of its own dynamic, undemocratic in the terms of the system, and counterviolence is from the beginning inherent in this dynamic. Thus, the radical is guilty either of surrendering to the power of the status quo or of violating the law and order of the status quo. You could just take responsibility for your life instead, but I guess that's surrendering to the status quo. Getting a job, maturing, those things you said you're not supposed to do, you could just do those things, but that would be surrendering to the status quo. Staying a clown apparently is better, her, to Herbert Marcuse. But who has the right to set himself up as judge of an established society? Who other than the legally constituted agencies or agents and the majority of the people? Other than these, it could only be a self-appointed elite or leaders who would arrogate to themselves such judgment. And indeed, if the alternative were between a democracy and dictatorship, no matter how benevolent, the answer would be non-controversial. Democracy is preferable. However, this democracy does not exist. And the government is factually exercised by a network of pressure groups and machines, vested interests represented by and working on and through the democratic institutions. These are not derived from a sovereign people. The representation is representative of the will shaped by the ruling minorities. Consequently, if the alternative is a rule by an elite, it would mean it would only mean replacement of the present ruling elite by another. And if this other should be the dreaded intellectual elite, it may not be less qualified and less threatening than the prevailing one. So he's suggesting that we should let the, the intellectuals, like himself, rule everything, the intelligentsia. True, such government initially would not have the endorsement of the majority inherited from the previous government. But once the chain of, past, of the past governments is broken, the majority would be in a state of flux and released from past management, free to judge the new government in terms of the new common interest. Just give us, the critical theorists, all the power. You won't like it at first. You won't give us majority support. You give us the power, and then everything will be in a state of flux. Socialism transforming out of capitalism into communism. Everything will be in a state of flux. And then because you're now free from the old rules, the old order, you can judge it in terms of this new common interest, which we're trying to enforce on everybody. That's his vision. Put the intellectual, the communist intellectuals in charge the neo-Marxist critical theorist intellectuals in charge, 
and we will show you how great it's going to be. He says, to be sure, this has never been the course of a revolution, but it is equally true that never before has a revolution occurred which had at its disposal the present achievements of productivity and technical progress. That's ominous given what's going on with social media, etc., surveillance, etc. Of course, they could be effectively used for imposing another set of repressive controls, but our entire discussion was based on the proposition that the revolution would be liberating only if it were carried by the non-repressive forces, the critical theorists, stirring in the existing society. The proposition is no more and no less than a hope. Prior to its realization, it is indeed only the individual, the individuals, who can judge, with no other legitimation than their consciousness and their conscience. But these individuals are more and other than private persons with their particular contingent preferences and interests. Their judgment transcends their subjectivity to the degree to which it is based upon independent thought and information on rational analysis and evaluation of the society. In other words, to the degree that they're critical theorists. They're not one-dimensional men. They are now critical theory, two-dimensional men. The existence of a majority of individuals capable of such rationality has been the assumption on which democratic theory has been based. If the established majority is not composed of such individuals, Individuals, it does uh, it does not think will enact as a sovereign people. The old story, right against right, the positive codified enforceable right of the existing society against the negative unwritten and unenforceable right of transcendence, which is part of the very existence of man in history, the right to insist on a less compromised, less guilty, less exploited humanity. Again, whether you want to call it Hegelianism or communism, Progressive Hegelianism, young Hegelianism, or communism, here we are. The two rights must come into violent conflict as long as the established society depends for its functioning on exploitation and guilt. Yeah, sure, that's exactly all that it's about. The opposition cannot change the state of affairs by the very means which protect and sustain the state of affairs, so you have to use Antifa. Beyond it, there are, our own, there are only the ideal and the offense and those who claim for their offending action a right to have to answer, sorry, a right have to answer for their, something's not here, right? Beyond it, there are only the ideal and the offense, and, to, and those who claim for their offending action a right to have to answer for their action before the tribunal of the existing society. There was a missing word there, sorry. For neither conscious, conscience nor commitment to an ideal can legalize the subversion of an established order which defines order, so legal is bad, or even legalize disturbance of the peace which is the peace of the established order. The latter alone belongs to the lawful right to abrogate peace and to organize the killing and beating. In the established vocabulary, violence is a term which one does not apply to the action of the police the National Guard, the Marshals, the Marines, the Bombers, the bad words are a priori reserved for the enemy, and their meaning is defined and validated by the actions of the enemy, regardless of their motivation and goal. No matter how good the end, it does not justify the illegal means. This is really an intense part, okay? So he's He's in this whole thing that he's saying that the legal structure and the power that, that, that wants it doesn't allow the world to change. It doesn't allow illegal action that would subvert its own power, destroy its own power. And that's a big problem. So here he's actually going to have a discussion of the ends justifying the means. Okay. Let me just reread that last part and dive into the next paragraph. For neither conscience nor commitment to an ideal can legalize the subversion of an established order which defines order. Or even le so the the existing order gets to define what is order, what is not order, and so you cannot possibly, no matter what, you're not you need not your conscience, not a commitment to a bigger ideal, can legalize subversion of the order if that order it gets to define what order actually is. It says, or even legalize disturbance of the peace, which is the peace of the established order. So it's all this typical critical theory neo-Marxist stuff where the order itself is this kind of evil malevolent thing with all this power that doesn't allow any substantive change in other words doesn't allow communism to come in um, and he says that there's no legal way to do it because even the idea of of 
legality and of order is defined by the order. And even the idea of peace is peace within the order. So you actually have to smash out of the system even to be able to talk about it, which is, of course, depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at a truly repressive state, you maybe have something going on. If you're looking at free countries, you have it's a complete confusion. If you're looking at a free country, you have a completely different set of circumstances. These people do not understand the idea whatsoever of a free country because they hate the idea of a free country because it's not a communist country, which they believe is the only true freedom, which of course never gets there, never works, and it's just a disaster along the way, but they think it's just going to work next time. So he says, you can never do that, right? You can never do that. And so he says, the bad words, I skip the violence, etc., cetera, are, are a priori reserved for the enemy, and he actually capitalizes enemy, and their meaning is defined and validated by the actions of the enemy, regardless of their motivations and goal. So he's trying to say there should be motivations and goal that are worth justifying to where you shouldn't be called violent if you're violent. You shouldn't be called disruptive if you're, if you're disruptive. You shouldn't be called a problem if you're a problem. So no matter how good the end, it does not justify the illegal means within the system, of course, is what he means. And then he says, the proposition, the ends justify the means, is indeed, as a general statement, intolerable, but... <laughs> Here's your leftism, gang. The proposition, the ends justify the means, is indeed, as a general statement, intolerable, but... There's a but. The ends justify the means, no good, but... Sometimes good. That's what he's, he's about to argue that. The proposition, the ends just for the means, is indeed as a general statement intolerable, but so is, as a general statement, its negation. In radical political practice, so we're going to have a dialectical synthesis, right? In radical political practice, the end belongs to a world different from and contrary to the established universe of discourse and behavior. We're going to have to sublate, Alfaben. But the means belong to the latter and are judged by the latter on its own terms, the very terms which the end invalidates. Fancy philosophical language, right? In radical political practice, let's go slow, the end belongs to a world different from and contrary to the established universe of discourse and behavior. So the end is something we can't judge because it's outside of the system by which we do our judgment. But the means belong to the established order and are judged within the established order on its terms, the very terms that the end outside of that order invalidates. So he's saying that if you have the right transformational end, communism, if you have the right transformational ends, then you can't judge the means from the existing system because they can only be judged by what they accomplish. In other words, he says the ends justify the means is indeed, as a general statement, intolerable, but when it's for my purposes, it's necessary. That's his argument. For example, he writes, assuming an action aims at stopping crimes against humanity committed in the professed national interest, and the means to attain this goal are acts of organized civil disobedience. Remember, he was just calling for uncivil disobedience, though. In accordance with the established law and order, not the crimes, but the attempt to stop them is condemned and punished as a crime. Thus, it is judged by the very standards which the action indicts. The existing society defines a transcending action on its society's own terms, a self-validating procedure entirely legitimate, even necessary for the society. One of the most effective rights of the sovereign is the right to establish enforceable definitions of words. What a really weird way to put that. Very postmodern. The established order gets to decide the definitions of words, which then determine reality, and in particular moral reality, good and bad, within that particular order. But if the ends are an order that transcends it, that sublates it, that are better than, that it's on the other end of, say, a dialectical synthesis or movement, then you can't possibly judge. You're too low on the dialectical pole. You can't judge actions taken to achieve a noble end, a greater good, from within a system that doesn't have the greater good. That's, and, and it's because you get to define the words within the system, that's what they get to do. That's his argument for the ends justify the means, which he fully believes when it's his ends and his means. 
That's his whole argument. That's what repressive tolerance is a long-form argument for. Political linguistics, he says, armor of the establishment. Iron law evoke projection, anybody? If the radical opposition develops its own language, it protests spontaneously, subconsciously against one of the most effective secret weapons of domination and defamation. He's calling, calling for creating, the radical opposition creating its own parallel language. Do you see what's going on? Are you paying attention yet, as they say? If the radical opposition develops its own language, it protests spontaneously, subconsciously against one of the most effective secret weapons of domination and defamation, the armor of the establishment, political linguistics. He says the language of the prevailing law and order, validated by the courts and by the police, is not only the voice, but also the deed of suppression. The language of is the deed of suppression. This language is violence. This language not only defines and condemns the enemy, meaning him, the communist, it also creates him. And this creation is not the enemy as he really is, but rather as he must be in order to perform his function for the establishment. In other words, it's not that people that are communists are trying to tear our society down are bad. It's that we name them as bad so that they can be a scapegoat for which we maintain the, so, the order. See? Of course. Iron Law Evoke Projection. The end now does justify the means. Action ceased to be... So he's now projecting that ends justify the means for the establishment, right? Action ceased to be crimes if they serve to preserve and extend the free world. That's in scare quotes. Conversely, what the enemy does is evil. Because it freaking is. You capitalize the enemy. When you capitalize the enemy, isn't that Satan? Isn't that actually evil by definition? What he says, propaganda. Well, turns out, correct, Marcuse, what you're doing is propaganda. You're modifying the language in order to propagandize. And you're doing critical theory, which tells a bogus story in order to propagandize. And you said that you have to do that. The leftist intelligentsia that you're grooming in college is then going to groom the minorities where that energy lies in the ghettos to do that for you. Propaganda. This a priori linguistic defamation hits first the enemy abroad, the defense of his own land, his own hut, his own naked life is a crime, the supreme crime which deserves a supreme punishment, long before the special and not-so-special forces are physically trained to kill, burn, and interrogate, their minds and bodies are already desensitized to see and hear and smell in the capital O other, not a human being but a beast. A beast, however, which is subject to all-out punishment. Seems like a huge exaggeration, but he's talking about war, but it still seems like a huge exaggeration. The linguistic pattern constantly repeats itself. In Vietnam, typical criminal communist violence, that sends quotes, is perpetrated against American strategic operations. The Reds have the impertinence to, quote, launch a sneak attack. Sneak attack. Presumably... They are supposed to announce it beforehand and deploy in the open. They are, quote, evading a death trap. Presumably, they should have stayed in. The Viet Cong attack American barracks, quote, in the dead of night and kill American boys. Appa uh, presumably, Americans only attack in the broad daylight, don't disturb the sleep of the enemy, and don't kill Vietnamese boys. The massacre of hundreds of thousands of communists in Indonesia is called, quote, impressive. A comparable, quote, killing rate suffered by the other side would hardly have been honored with such an adjective. To the Chinese, funny to invoke that here, the presence of American troops in East Asia is a threat to their, quote, ideology, while presumably the presence of Chinese troops in Central or South America would be a real and not only an ideological threat to the United States. Woo, boy. Things he's defending there. And projecting the idea of a modified language in order to do it. This linguistic universe, which incorporates the enemy, again capitalized, as Untermunch, so the underman, the, that which is below mankind, a, a subaltern maybe, into the routine of everyday speech can be transcended only in action. He says, so if we're dehumanizing, we can only take action to overcome that. For violence is built into the very structure of this society, as the accumulated aggressiveness which drives the business of life in all branches of corporate capitalism, as the legal aggression on the highways, and as the national aggression abroad, which seems to become more brutal the more it takes as its victims the wretched of the earth. But it was just communist a minute ago. Those who have not yet been civilized by the capital of the free world. 
and the mobilization of this aggressiveness, ancient, ancient uh, psychical forces are activated to serve the economic political needs of the system. The enemy are those who are unclean, infested. They are animals rather than humans. They are contagious, the domino theory, and threaten the clean, anesthetize healthy free world. Uh-oh, vaccine passports. The enemy are those who are unclean, infested. They are animals rather than humans. They are contagious and threaten the clean, anesthetized, healthy, free world. Uh oh, vaccine passports. They must be liquidated, smoked out, and burned out like venom. Marcuse, your own movement has turned on you. Their infested jungles must be must too be burned out and cleared for freedom and democracy. The enemy already has its fifth column inside the clean world. The commies and the hippies and their like with their long hair and the beards and the dirty pants. Well, there we got some projection. Confession by projection. You are correct. Though the enemy, by the way, notice that they've switched basically to communists. Those who are promiscuous can <laughs> He's so dirty. And take liberties which are denied, denied to the clean and orderly who remain clean and orderly even when they kill and bomb and burn. Quick, emotional, stab them. They're, they're clean, they actually are clean and orderly. Better make them evil. Never perhaps since the Middle Ages has accumulated repression erupted on such a global scale and organized aggression against those outside the repressive system, outsiders within and without. This guy's a total nut job. Communist. In the face of the scope and intensity of this sanctioned aggression, the traditional distinction between legitimate and illegitimate violence becomes questionable. If legitimate violence includes in the daily routine of pacification and liberation, wholesale burning, poisoning, bombing, the actions of the radical opposition, no matter how illegitimate, can hardly be called by the same name, violence. So when the radicals are violent, they're not being violent. They're being something better than violent because everything is violent. Again, it's repressive tolerance all over again. Can there be any meaningful comparison in magnitude and criminality between the unlawful acts committed by the rebels in the ghettos, on the campuses, on the city streets on the one side, and the deeds perpetrated by the forces of order in Vietnam, in Bolivia, in Indonesia, and in Guatemala on the other? Can one meaningfully call it an offense when demonstrators disrupt the business of a university, the draft board, the supermarket, the flow of traffic? to protest against the far more efficient disruption of the business of life of untold numbers of human beings by the armed forces of law and order. Remember, these are actually, these wars were at least presumably fought to stop the march of communism that is trying to create global communism, which is the thing he's pretending he's not actually trying to defend, although he keeps defending it throughout the entire damn essay. Here, too, the brute reality requires a redefinition of terms. The established vocabulary discriminates a priori, Against the opposition, it protects the establishment. Law and order. These words, and this is the last paragraph of this section, these words have always had an ominous sound. In, to people who want to be criminals, I mean, the entire necessity and the entire horror of legitimate force are condensed and sanctioned in this phrase. There can be no human association without law and order, enforceable law and order. But there are degrees of good and evil in human associations. <laughs> of course, but. Measured in terms of the legitimate organized violence required to protect the established society against the poor, the oppressed, the insane, the victims of its well-being. Over and above their legitimacy in constitutional terms, the extent to which the established law and order can be legitimately demand, or sorry, can legitimately demand and command obedience and compliance largely depends or ought to depend on the extent to which this law and this order obey and comply with their own standards and values. So this is actually huge. It doesn't sound huge. He's saying that the whole thing is hypocrisy, it has nothing to do with reality, has nothing to do with human nature, has nothing to do with the complexities of the world. It's is there hypocrisy that he can identify through his critical theory. This is Hegelian thought. Over and above their legitimacy in constitutional terms, the extent to which the established law and order can legitimately demand and command obedience and compliance largely depends or ought to depend on the extent to which this law and this order obey and comply with their own standards and values. The Hegelian, Marxian, um, Neo-Marxian, I guess also, Gnostic faith materialist Gnostic faith, or modern Gnostic faith, if you want, is a better way to put it, modern Gnosticism, sees the world 
this way. There is no natural order, or the natural order that exists is corrupt and evil. We've been flung into it. That's Heidegger. We are are miserable here, and everything, therefore, really within it is arbitrary. It's their own standards and values. So you, the only thing to do is to pick at hypocrisy, to pick at the gaps, to pick at the failures of the difficulties of life or trade-off, because the order itself could be perfected if you just let these people have power. It's actually really big. These, he says, may, be, may first be ideological, like the ideas of liberty, equality, fraternity, advanced by the revolutionary bourgeoisie, but the ideology can become a material political force in the armor of, op- of the opposition as these values are betrayed, compromised, denied in the social reality. Then the betrayed promises are, as it were, taken over by the opposition, and with them the claim for legitimac- legitimacy. In other words, he's saying we're going to co-opt ideas like liberty, equality, and fraternity. The opposition is going to show how they, their values are betrayed, compromised, and denied in the social reality, and then they are taken over by the opposition and with them the claim for legitimacy. In other words, we're subverting the meaning of ideas like liberty, equality, and fraternity. We're going to replace them with liberation and equity and solidarity. And the new legitimacy is going to arise. We're going to have a new sensibility, etc., that he talked about earlier in the essay. In this situation, he says, law and order become something to be established as against the established law and order. Communist entryism. We're going to come in, we're going to create new law and order to establish against the established law and order. Up becomes down, right becomes wrong, black becomes white. We're going to invert the existing order, and we're going to have our new law and order in our new managed state as we go through. He says the existing society has become illegitimate, unlawful. It has invalidated its own law. Such has been the dynamic of the historical revolutions. It is hard to see how it can be arrested indefinitely. So there's his case. Part three of Herbert Marcuse's horrific essay on liberation from 1969. And we see just how dark and how crazy things are. So Again, just to summarize briefly, part one, we had a biological foundation for socialism. We have to change man to be incapable of operating in the existing society. In other words, we have to groom psychopathology into him so that he will reject the existing society. Then we're going to interject into him a new sensibility, a new way of thinking about the world, which has clearly been fulfilled by intersectionality. And then in part three, forces in transition, you can see that coming to pass. You can see him calling upon the critical theorists grooming the radical activists in the so-called minority or ghetto populations to harness their energy, to abandon the working class as the left, and to move into a new left that's going to be identity political as guided by neo-Marxist theory. You also see the the, um, precursors of the acceptance of postmodern theory, which has not yet been developed, is only beginning to be developed. Marcuse might have been aware of some of that. Adorno and he were both tilting in that direction that knowledge is itself political. He said that explicitly. That's basically the Foucauldian thesis. So you can see all of the elements starting to come together here um, for the, the mess that we live in. So when I keep saying to people that we live in Marcuse's world, I say we live in repressive tolerance. We also live in the world created by the essay on liberation. We also live in the world created by one dimensional man where we have this multidimensional or kaleidoscopic consciousness that's supposed to, it's Jose Medina's term for intersectional uh, political consciousness, critical consciousness, is that we, we, we have to think in terms of this new intersectional set of uh, identity politics positions for everything to understand everything. And that, he says, is going to allow the revolution to come. And in the very closing, he says, you know, that this cannot be arrested. It's hard to see how this can be arrested indefinitely. And his explicit advocation here is, or is that a word? He explicitly advocates for the ends justifying the means because he has a utopian, he even said at the beginning, end in mind that justifies it. The ends are going to justify the means. The means should include violence and illegality. They should also be done by repurposing the language so as to re- define and capture the words upon which the social order that we live in operates and to redefine them in a subversive way that allows them to reorder society in a revolutionary fashion. There we have part three 
of Herbert Marcuse's essay on liberation. This is a scary document. We live in a scary world. We have to actually resist these things. We have to be able to understand them so that we can stand back against, stand up against them. Um, we do not want good trouble, beautiful trouble. We actually do want a orderly society that provides prosperity and so on. And we don't want to lose it chasing a utopian, an explicitly said utopian vision that requires a biological change in man and a complete reordering of our sensibility from things that we have slowly generated through the Enlightenment going forward by, re, by, by, by taking the best of human thought over thousands of years. We want to, don't want to throw that away to replace it with communism, which basically, no matter how it's been tried, no matter which way people have attempted it, has failed and failed and failed and failed and killed millions. And his ignorance of the fact, he's writing in praise of these rebellions and these movements, etc., and his ignorance of the fact that the one that he's already held up, which is the one in China at the beginning of the essay, is literally killing tens of millions of people while he's writing this, is every bit of proof that you need that these people don't know what they're talking about. They have a terrible plan. It's trying to take over over America now, Western civilization now. It is not going to work this time. It's going to be terrible. Um, and it's up to us to do something about it. Now, you also can see, on the other hand, where I've kind of wryly commented that it's already been co-opted. It's already been co-opted by the forces that he would hate, except that it's his movement that he wants. And he would say, because he ends justify the means, that that's what has to happen. So woke capital, BlackRock, etc., taking over all this stuff in the attempt to create his movement is something we have to presume he would support because he would say that the ends justify the means this time because he believe it will work this time. So we are now, at, if you want to, my opinion on the, the, the place we are, this movement initiated by Herbert Marcuse in the 1960s has been growing and building to a peak. We are at the moment or near the moment of its climax. It appears in my estimation to be uh, grasping for power that it can't quite grip, that people are aware of it and they're angry about it, and that I'm therefore afraid because they're going to get desperate and they're going to get dangerous as a result. And I think that that's what we have coming because Marcuse's world wasn't going to work either. Our quest is to pick the path out of this, and we must, and to pick the path out of this that minimizes genuine terrible reactionary backlash and that minimizes the amount of damage that happens as these falsehoods as these crackpot theories start collapsing on themselves that's our challenge right now that every one of us has to rise up to and the fate of future generations and the rest of our own lives actually depends very heavily on what we do at this time